I don't know. Hello. Yes, Mark. Um, my video is not enabled yet. Yeah, Osby, did you re-log in? Yes. Yeah, I can see you're good. Yeah. Just give me a second. Okay. You're talking still in, right? You know, stay in. 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 You should be on knocked on global now. Did you find it? My video is still disabled, guys. Might be safe cast no switch. That was long enough to safe cast one. Maybe it's one, yeah. Oh, no, safe one. <laughs> you should it should just come on if he if he's here and he's on it i'm not on it hey oh, okay. Asby, I'm, i know what it is hang in okay just relax huh? you should it should work now okay oh there we go hi yeah but can you make me a oh, good morning no it's big you one is the key Oh, we got you one. Okay. Wait. No, that's the Alcatel one. Where's the one for this one? There should be a page for this one too. Try safe test one, all lowercase. All lowercase. Yeah. I did that one already. Safe test one? Yep. Okay, and then try it with the I'm a connected. Nope. Okay. <sighs> There's another thing to do. Oh, wait, I have. It's the safe test with the big S. Yeah, he's with a copy of capital S. Okay. Joe, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Should I be looking in this morning? Good morning. Hi, morning. Joe, can you, you hear me? You should be on Slack on the Yes. Piece, uh, but Joe, Joe, can um, Joe hear me? Okay. Joe, Peter, stop Say what? Joe, Peter, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can barely, I can kind of hear you. Okay, that's good. Nice t-shirt. It's sound, but I don't understand, but that's my fault. What am I doing here? Emmy, you look awesome. Thank you. Safe guest mask. Yeah, I'll get my mask. Can you hear me? I'm connected. Oh, I'm connected to Knox on phones. Knox on global. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. On global, yeah. Global. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> so, so how do we get the be able to he sent you a link. Joe's oh. trying to connect to the Zoom as well. What's the, where did he send it? In, in Slack or in email? email? It has to come directly to your email. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I can reset the email right now. Just hang in. Yeah. I'm going to keep this one muted though, so it doesn't say anything. Or it's just terrible. Oh, I've got scissors. I'll put them in my, my back. Eight forty-one. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Is it raining? Yes. yes. Uh, a lot. A lot. Yeah. Reasonable fair amount rain. That's not gonna turn. All right. This All is right. how this is how to adjust. You pull it like this? Yeah, you can set exactly on both sides. Yeah, mm -hmm. both sides and you can okay. okay, in May on. I just sent resend the email. To Joe? Joe. Here's my mask. Safecast.org email account. Mm -hmm. Looking for it. Oh, what the? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Advertising. I'll use Google Meet instead of Zoom. You can tell I'm trying to Zoom and it wants to take my event schedule. Thanks, <laughs> 
I'm not seeing it. Kelsey Stewart, panelists for That's it. That's okay. I thought it was coming from Peter. Yeah, the email came from Kelsey. Okay. Are you sending the link? Quick link. Let's see. Uh, right. see yeah, quick. Oh, this quick one. Quick yeah. Everybody knows the order is viewing the Zoom. Here we go. Always. We're going to say the red words go away. I'm apologizing. Yes, it's this is going to come down. Make sure it's muted. Okay, so I'm muted. Oh, you're on it. Yeah, it's on it. It won't go all the way down. There it goes. I might not make his mute, isn't it? I don't think so. Unmute. Yeah. Unmute, no video. Are, are we going to run both in parallel or are we going to have only one? I was hoping I could make mine silent. Oh, there's Sean. Sean, good morning. Not working. I think we should. Yeah. Um, I need a. My stylus. A plug that goes in the, the headphones or to make it stop. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think maybe we just we don't need it right now, so maybe just hit the road and uh, deal with that after we stop. Because we need to get gas and we need to get stuff. Right? Um, do we need gas? Yeah. Uh, not quite three quarters. Okay. Want to get gas first? Mm -hmm. um, Up to you. Canceling this because we're, we're now kind of tight on time, right? Now we're tight. Yeah, we have one minute to leave, but I mean, yeah, but rather than having power, having important is, is once the program runs, uh, you, you basically need to very carefully manage your mute control because the moment you're unmute, you're you will be in the program, okay? Yeah, like that, exactly. yep. Sean, good morning. Morning. How are you guys? Happy anniversary. Good. good. We're good. We're good. We're hitting the road. Where's your safe guest head? <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll do you one better. That's about right. that I have branding yeah I I would say yes <laughs> Sean how could it be a day without you you know you gotta make it happen right here I'll even I'll even I'll even like one up this ready Hold on. ready check this out boom <laughs> I'm going to have my PC up. Um, maybe like if there's a question, maybe you can like cue me and then I can open it. Otherwise, I'm going to put them away. Yes. Because I think it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's you. I, I can see it on, uh, you can send it to the safecast10.com. Yeah. So usually, like, I would just put it here. And then if, yeah, if I didn't notice, you can just say questions here, like check Slack or something. Are you, you're not sending all the questions. Okay, so this is, this is our show now. Mm -hmm. This is what our... So, so we're supposed to see the screen here, right? Yeah. I, I don't see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. And once we sit here, we can see ourselves here. 
or not? Interesting. This room is not showing. You say auto, then it will go to where you They're supposed to. Why would I do that if I just want to switch between this direction? No, you can't. You can now switch between any stream. No, no, that's the next one. If it's green, it's the next one. Yeah, it's not it's on yet. Green is next Whatever is red is on now. Red it still is on. Okay. And you can now see, you can see where you want to go. And you can auto. Or, or. We're going to have a clubhouse firing up shortly too. What is next? This is what is all. Has anyone heard from Yamadera? Anyone heard from Yamadera? Yeah, no. No, he's not online. We've not seen anything. Oh, okay, good. He said he was calling to meet you guys. Okay. okay. I don't know, you need to be snowboarding. Yeah, I'm just gonna. <laughs> Thank you. Sorted by number, and the number is called now. What is in the playbook? I put notes on that. Oh, it's tea. Yeah. It's tea. That's tea. No, it looks like. Yeah, it's tea. Where you the tea? Yeah, I think they got it wrong. No way. What's this one? That's empty. It's okay. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> so, 
exactly the same thing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're all numbered now in, in there. So that end there, right? So we look at that. Then you might as well be thinking. How many seconds do we have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Hi, good morning. So at nine, how to nine we put into YouTube? Sean, from your end, uh, once we're live on YouTube, which is in a few minutes, could you tweet it out? Yep, I'm just, I, I actually just tweeted it seconds ago that said we'll be live in a few minutes. Oh, seriously? I did. I, I'm on That's it. Amazing. <laughs> I am fucking on it. You Man. don't even know. I mean, in social know. media. Damn. Awesome. Fucking internets and shit. Damn. Yeah, lots of lots of traffic on the uh, on the old Twitter right now because I launched the Safecast Live site and lots of people are retweeting it, passing it around. It's getting the buzz. People are buzzing. Uh, quick check, guys. Um, did Emu, Emu get uh, an email? Oh, she got it. Okay. She's got. She's gonna log in now. Yeah, she's got that email. Peter, do you want to? Well, you want to be the. You want to get rid of the map and go back to. The Peter, do you want to wear this mic yourself? Because you're going to move around? You take this? Yeah. Yeah. So, because you might forget. Yeah, yeah, somebody has a mic on that's rubbing and making a lot of noise. Mm. That was me. Is it the noise back? No more noise? Is it good? No noise now. Yes, good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I've got 16 people waiting at this point. Why is it not running? Can somebody go to YouTube and see where we're up? I'm trying to get in right now. Why is that's not where you're going to be when we're on air, right? Yeah, it's a fun. It's not seventeen people are waiting. Is it running? Yes. It is running? You know, I know, but, but why is it not? Oh, it will go live at nine. Because the start time is nine, right? Yeah, you, if you have it planned, it won't go live until right when it's supposed to go live. 
people who get in? I don't know. I'm just, you know. All right. Maybe. So then. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, really, you know? Play some music. Boom. Let me turn my light on. What? Um, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to put a splash screen and we're going to play the video. That's for five minutes. And then we're cutting in, right? So, so once we're live, we don't talk. And Jonathan needs to go and move out of that position. So Where can I sit? Uh, on the high tables over there. Yeah, no, yeah. Over there. yeah the, we well, can. No, 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 no. Over, over there is much better, much yeah, way better. I'm gonna yeah. start the. Um, the power I'm will gonna start in a minute. In a minute. I'm gonna start the. Um, I'm gonna start the clubhouse back channel room right now. Okay, good. Um, link. Nando, good morning. I'm going to tweet it too. Live stream back channel. House. Boom. So, did you start streaming? Yeah, it is streaming. It's streaming to YouTube right now. Okay. Okay, hello. That's okay, good. Um, hopefully, the clubhouse thing will work and it won't be too annoying as the back on this piece. We'll see. I'm the only one in there right now, but other people will join eventually, I imagine.
Hey guys. Hey Sean. Yes. Oh. We're trying to get the um, YouTube stream. YouTube to go. I can see it in studio that it is running, but nobody else can see it live. Is there some something that comes to mind? Uh, I've never done YouTube streaming, um, but let me go click and see if I can see anything from here. Well, here. I, I can't see anything, guys. It says waiting for SafeCast TV. We're obviously using something. Can you hear me or is my mic messed up? Can hear you. Okay. Try again. Yeah. Try again. Oh. The date is correct. Time is okay. Twenty six waiting. No, no. He's doing something. So I try to restart it. It's like there's got to be some something that you would click that would hit let me start to, or something, right? Uh, let me try to restart it for a second. The thing is, in studio, I see it come in, and it is running. But Ray, good morning. Good morning. Maybe I should type uh, technical difficulties in the chat. As long as you're here in studio, I can. Yeah, here it is. Excellent condition running. Is there something like go live button? I can't find it. Can you go to your YouTube? Uh, go to your YouTube account. Oh, this is it. Okay. Are you guys in the right account? I mean, that might be a trick. No, it's just on YouTube. It's streaming here. It's right now. You know, it's working here. Preview. Preview. Is there a link to this one that you can send me to make sure that here? Maybe go to edit. Should be. Is it in here? Sean, any early uh, reactions to here. Safecast out live? Huge, huge positive so far. Um, the the little bit of, of feedback. I'll, I'll send you a couple, but. Uh, Rob Sheridan, who is the uh, head designer for Nine Inch Nails, oh, so already was, sent it to his whole network everywhere and said guys, what a cool project it well, is. And you guys, we're going to launch. Can you all go on mute, please? Thank you. Yep. <laughs> so we've got this going, all right? Make us 
you care Make a smile and goodness gracious So infectious I said no one can resist the urge To a smile back at you Yes, so for some reason it went and then it stopped again. Um, yeah. And now we have two of these. Obviously not getting something right. The blue one, right? Your life. Can you try now? It says your life. May take a few seconds? Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay.
fingers to a smile back at you. And when they do make a smile back at you, it help them open up their eyes and take a look at you. That's when they see Okay. Good morning, everybody. Ohayou gozaimasu. Welcome from Tokyo. Uh, Safecar's 10th anniversary kicked off. Sorry for a small delay there. We were pressing the wrong buttons, probably, but <laughs> we got it going. So uh, I'm here together with Emmy. And we're going to coach you through the day today. And we have a lot of guests lined up. It's going to be an exciting day. We're going to drive around. You can see uh, Asbi and Joe and Emmy in the car. And we're going to say hello to them uh, very quickly. Uh, Asbi, uh, please come howdy. in. Hey, howdy. How are you? Good to see you. Great. We're on the road. Yes. Rainy day. Right, exactly. So uh, raining in Tokyo as well. Uh, you know, we had wonderful weather yesterday, but I guess, you know, sometimes it has to rain and we're going to do our best to, to make this happen. Um, so, uh, Asmi, we're going to flip over to you a little bit later. You're going, to, you're going to talk about what we're all going to do, but for everybody, today we have two major sections. We're going to start with the ride, which is a ride uh, through the Fukushima zone 10 years later on. We're going to stop at a lot of places that have played a critical role in that accident. We're going to talk to people there, and, and, Asby, is, and Asby and Joe and Emu are going to be our, our coach. Uh, we're going to talk to some folks while we're driving. Guests will come on uh, the Zoom call and will share their experiences, and we're going to talk about a few things there. Uh, and then in, uh, when we get later in, in the show, uh, we're going to uh, switch to, uh, to our European uh, volunteer team, and they're going to uh, talk to a lot of uh, people uh, and around citizen science, around safe cost, and around other topics that have to do with the safe cost uh, mission, and uh, and we're going to do that. So I want to kind of stop here and and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very quick thing, uh, Asbi, where are you guys right now? Uh, we're we're in Fukushima. I, I I don't know if you can see us on screen. Maybe we're not on screen right now. Yeah, no, so maybe, but, maybe, maybe but we anyway, can... we're in Fukushima yes. yeah, on Route Six right at Tomioka, heading to J Village. Heading to J Village, right? Yeah, I remember J Village very well. This is one of my first drives. I went there, and it was full parked with fire trucks at that time, and you couldn't get in because it was was stacked up with that. And uh, so that's great. So we're going to go there soon. So I want to quickly switch to, 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 our, uh, to our contingent in Canada, you know, uh, Sean, let's, let's bring on Sean here. Hello. So, hey, good morning, Hello. Sean. What are you doing Hi. in Canada? I'm doing great in Canada. It's not rainy and it's yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Safe Cost Headquarters in, in North America. Uh, yes, Sean, you can tell from, from our branding here, this is... This is yeah, central, you know, central base. We'll talk about the branding later, Sean. Um, 
So, so what I what I want to uh, first of all, what I'm going to do is is we're basically socially distanced here, and I'm going to take this off so that you know you can hear us better. But we just wanted to you know, you know if if you don't notice it very well, you know you may you may want to uh, you may want to see here. Uh, these are the safe cost masks. You can get them in the shop. Uh, Sean, you want to talk about the shop? Yeah, the shop has all sorts of fantastic SafeCast merch in it right now. So uh, you see some of it on display there with Peter, SafeCast hats and pillows and new shirts and masks and everything. We just got this up. So it's definitely something that uh, you should get if you're into that kind of thing. We've got a lot of it. Um, Sean, there are some other reveals that we have done around the 10th anniversary. You want to maybe talk a little bit about one or two of those? Well, uh, one of them that I can talk about briefly, which will sort of maybe lead into to some of what, what Ray's talking about, of course, is the we just sent this out moments ago, is a, a new website called safecast.live, which is a, kind of a fun, a fun experiment to see uh, what kind of music would be made by the data stream coming in from our sensors. So we have a, a feed coming in of radiation and air quality data that triggers different samples and um, we'll just continue to play in you know eternally evolving audio stream of sound so you can sort of listen to these uh, measurements come in from all around the world and as new sensors be continue to be deployed the stream will get busier and busier and it just constantly changing and it's uh, absolutely delightful we just launched that minutes ago Sean, it's super awesome. Maybe, maybe in a few moments, we're going to talk to Ray Ozzy as well. Maybe, you know, you can pull out that screen and, and share it for a few, a few moments with everybody watching. It would be great. And I think there's some other thing that went live, I believe, very momentarily that you may want to mention or... Uh, which, which, which one was that? Oh, no, sorry, sorry. You know, so what I was going to say is you, you may want to share that the, the safe cards are live. Stream uh, if you have a if you have that handy on your machine if you can share your screen we can just show folks what it is. I don't have permissions to share the screen. Share my, That's share because you're screen. the first one, so we're going to fix that. That's very. <laughs> uh, Kelsey, can you yes? And just you know, just we may flip the camera around later in the day. We we are here with a big team here in Tokyo. Uh, Kelsey Stewart from Lovework is is manning the session. We have Michael Goldberg who has been uh, covering Fukushima from its early days onwards behind the cameras. We have Nondo. He is going to talk later about his experience with Big Eyes. We have Jonathan Wilder in the back. He is watching our streams and he's also making sure that we're not going to be hungry. And uh, and here it is. Okay. And 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 we have Bob Ward. We're going to talk in a moment. Oh, right, hey, Sean. This looks. Uh, Looks pretty interesting. Okay, so you got it going. Yeah, it's going. So as different measurements come in, I don't know if you can hear it. I'm not sure if the screen uh, sharing. Yeah, there is no sound at the moment, but yeah, it's wasn't... fine. I, I just maybe you, you may want to explain a little bit about the sound and what what is happening. Yeah. Here. So, so what's happening is uh, as the data stream comes in from air sensors, uh, it's showing up on these little slices of maps that are that are popping up around, and uh, each each different measurement is pegged to a different sample. Low measurements are some samples. High measurements are other samples. Radiation is one kind of sample. Air quality is another kind of sample. So. As these data streams come in with all these different measurements, this just keeps changing and, and evolving. Uh, over here, you can see there's a little bit of information about the project. If you're on the site, you can click over and, and learn a little bit more about it. And then down here on the bottom right are, are other audio samples collections. So you can click different ones over here and listen to different things. We've got the default one that you hear on load is actually samples from Nine Inch Nails Ghost one through four project, which they uh, kindly licensed into the pub, into uh, Creative Commons for anybody to do anything they want with. And so we did something that they probably did not expect with it. And then we have uh, some samples from some older synthesizers and things, which sort of create a really uh, interesting soundscape that just kind of continues to evolve um, again as these as these readings come in. So you're actually listening to 
sort of a, a live stream of environmental readings from all around the world. It's pretty, um, it's pretty fantastic. You can just turn it on in the background and just let it run for, for hours and hours. Okay, that's 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 awesome. Uh, and and for those who don't know, Sean has been, uh, you know, one one of his passions is is to make music and specifically ambient style music. And if you listen to it, it gives you gives a great, uh, you know, a great soundscape, so to speak. Okay, so I want to just bring Bob Moore to 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 the front line. And just a small remark for Michael, if if you can gain up the gain on the the backlight correction, if you can bring up the the gain on the I think if you if you know how to do it or not, then don't worry about it. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fine. We'll 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 get there. Uh, if we can switch to to the the white the white to to Bob for a moment here, or Kelsey, if you can switch. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is. I uh, just want to introduce everybody to Bob Ward. He's going to be the musical director for today. Hello. And uh, Bob, just share with us what, what, what is on the musical menu. Uh, the first thing we have today is going to be a shakuhachi player named Bruce Huebner. He traveled around the world. He's uh, quite an interesting person. And uh, he's going to be joined by Andy Bevan, who uh, Andy plays uh, didgeridoo and saxophone and many things. And I, I think they've got something very interesting for you up to sleep today. And then after that, we have uh, Chris Koyama and uh, Fumika Asari, and uh, it's like a jazz duo. They, I've found them and uh, very interesting and very good. Fumika is a new uh, growing guitar player in Tokyo, and uh, she's very good, very young. Uh, the next band after that is uh, Christopher Hardy on percussion, and Andy Bevan again appears. He'll be playing uh, Indian flutes, uh, uh, soprano saxophone, and uh, Chris is quite amazing. You're gonna, that'll be quite a treat. He plays a lot of interesting things. Is <laughs> the Toy Meister, I guess you call him. Uh, there's another band after that. Will be Philip Wu, a great keyboardist who's played with Peter, everybody, right? with anybody, and uh, anybody and everybody. Uh, oh. You know, he played with Shaka Khan. He played Shaka with Maze. He played with Stevie Wonder. He, you know, he played with a lot of people. If you're into seventies and eighties, just a few uh, music, yeah. he, there's a good chance there. The, the, the yeah. keyboard riffs are Philip Wu. Philip was in the in the uh, touring the world at the time. That's right. Yes, and he's going to be joined by a really wonderful singer named Ashton Moore, and uh, they've got some little R and B. R&B, yeah, we're going to bring the soul and we're going to bring <laughs> the band right. back together. And then uh, the final act of the day will be uh, drummer Gene Jackson. He's a great jazz drummer, Was uh, toured with Herbie Hancock for nine years in his trio. Uh, so Many good. people will have heard about him, he is in, and he's accompanied by Pat Glenn. Pat Glenn on bass and uh, Makoto Oka, who's a wonderful tenor saxophone player and flutist. I, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, so I don't know what you're going to hear. <laughs> right, so, so that's going to be excitement. So what is exciting here is, is all these musicians here will be featured here from Tokyo Live. So in, we are at the Safecast office, but in our building there is a, there's a shared floor that we're using today to broadcast the music live. So it's kind of an experiment for all of us, uh, specifically in you know, the period of COVID. A lot of musicians have been able not to play, but we we're able to put them together in a very large room, and so we think that's going to work out really well. Uh, I think one thing that is that I want to mention is we started today with the song "Make Make a Smile," and Bob, you know, made oh, this song yes. specially for us today. So talk a little bit about right. your song. Right, that was basically like my old ad agency days. I finish it and hand it out one minute later, <laughs> <laughs> and it was perfectly on time. So thanks for that. Oh boy! And who did we see? We saw Gene, we saw in Gene Jackson. That's that's a little group that I've kind of starting out called the QK. The QK band, and it's uh, Chris Koyama on vocals, Gene Jackson plays electronic drums, and uh, Makoto Oko on the saxophone, on saxophone and, and flute on that song. And there's... then uh, uh, me on guitar and 
keyboards and programming because I'm not a very good keyboard player. So just a little bit about Bob Ward. So Bob Ward you know, spent many, many years in New York producing and, and mixing records. Yes. Uh, wrote a, a few hits, including for George Benson. Yeah. Uh, so if, you, if you're a George Benson fan, you, there's, a, there's a good chance with one yes. of the numbers is, yeah. is an is a original Bob Ward song. So let's go check that out. And, yes. and Bob has been in, in, in Japan for how many years? Uh, a few now. A few now, and, and, <laughs> and he, is, he, he is very much a part of the music community here. Yeah. And we're so honored to have you here and to have oh, everybody here, so we're going to check it out later. Uh, I think we're we're going to uh, we're going to uh, let you go back to the studio. I to think the, you've got a few things to take care. You have a few things to take care of, so you go off and, and get a, check all the microphones, check check everything what's happening there. Uh, Emmy, come back, and uh, I think we're 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 now back on track. We're on 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 schedule, uh, <laughs> even though we had a few hitches, and and, and and you know, isn't that part of doing a Zoom? Is is to have you know a few hitches. Uh, so I think all of us are, are getting used to that, but we're, we're very much live. Uh, just before we uh, jump, uh, before we go and talk to, to Ray, I just wanted to briefly describe about our office here. Uh, we're based here in Shibuya, right, Emmy? Yep. And uh, this has been our safe cost office for the last, uh, I think, four or five years now, uh, or longer maybe. And we're supported here by, by a company called Lovework, that is kind of a creative hub here in, in, in Tokyo. And the founder, Chiaki Hayashi, she will be uh, talking here later in the day about her experiences around SafeCast and why, uh, you know, why we are part of her, her office and why we're here. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that is going to happen. Our office, you know, if you can look, look a little bit around, we have some goodies here. We're going to talk about the goodies later. I'm going to show some stuff. But this is kind of a, where we have our workbench. This is where we build stuff, a lot of parts, you know, and, 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 and we have, you know, on the, on the right side, Kind of going to follow the camera slowly. We see Emmy but on the right side. These are kind of we're going to talk about this later. We have some of our prototypes and original big eigies, the things we have been working on over the last couple of years, and really devices have always been a very important part of our journey. And uh, so, uh, so today we have you know some some amazing news, and I would like to welcome uh, Ray uh, to uh, to the show. I'm not sure, Ray, are you are you on? Ray, good morning. Good morning. Hi, Ray. Hello. Ray, it's great to see you. Uh, I know that your room is not a background. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a background, no. Nope. <laughs> so, so you're calling in from where? I am calling in from just north of uh, Boston, Mass. So uh, it's morning, but it's not morning here. Uh, but a lot of... Um, a lot of R&D happens in this uh, home office. It's kind of a part home office, part um, place where I keep my memorabilia, old machines that I've worked on and stuff. But it's great to be here. It's, um, it's great to uh, celebrate this, um, this kind of milestone for the SafeCast project and for all the volunteers who have put so much of themselves into it with um, uh, you know, common goals of, of helping people uh, through open data and citizen science. It's uh, tremendous and thanks for inviting me. Yes, and, and just very quickly for our audience, uh, Ray Ozzy is known for many things. Uh, I started my life as a young software engineer using Ray's products, uh, Lotus Notes in the early 90s. And uh, Ray has been a, you know, an amazing uh, software engineer and entrepreneur, but uh, later in, in your career, you were the chief software architect uh, in the Bill Gates in Microsoft. Uh, I think you did something like building Azure and other things. So a lot of people are using that today. And But I know you, I met you personally literally exactly 10 years ago when we started SafeCast. And you were you're one of the, the, the founding members and also the, the brain trust of, 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 our, of us all. And, uh, and, and so you, you've been with us for, for 10 years. And maybe it's nice if you could share a little bit about you know, why you got excited about being a part of the Safe Cause journey and, and, and what that means to you. Absolutely. Um, I think if you try to place where you were at that time, I was, um, I was probably in the Boston area uh, or flying somewhere uh, uh, near here. And, uh, 
when the tsunami happened, when we started seeing the news flooded with the um, the uh, the awful news of what was what was transpiring, um, and immediately, you know, my my mind, uh, I think it's a, just a human thing to do. You you connect with people more if you have um, uh, you connect in your heart with people if you have met them or been there, traveling, and some of the um, uh, the best memories that my family and I have had uh, were in touring in Japan initially on business, but then for pleasure. Um, over the years, uh, the decades, I've uh, I grew to know um, many people, um, primarily in the Tokyo region. But um, uh, uh, immediately we thought, how are they doing? Are they safe? What what's you know what's happening? So I. Um, I pinged, I actually don't recall the exact um, order here, but uh, either I saw an email fly by or I pinged Joey Ito and I said, what can we do? Uh, what are people doing? Um, you know, how, how can, my skill is in technology, how can, um, how can I help? Is there any way that I can help? And he, he said many of uh, his colleagues, friends, associates, particularly in tech, um, uh, had been talking about this, and uh, he, he actually sent me a, a little draft of a, um, an action plan uh, of something called rdtn.org um, that uh, you know people were theorizing maybe we could find some way to mold technology into a way to measure radiation. Um, at that time, it was fairly challenging, um, uh, and. Uh, you folks should speak more authorita authoritatively about this, but um, my perception was that people on the ground really didn't understand whether they were safe or whether they weren't safe. Um, uh, there was no real data um, that was available to them. Um, uh, the government was under great stress. Um, they were not publishing data. Uh, the power company was under great stress. They were not publishing data. And we were trying to think, how can we, how can we potentially um, help. And so um, Joey uh, pulled together um, a set of people um, uh, with Sean and, and Peter as his uh, co-conspirators and um, you know, got a bunch of people together. And I'm, I'm not sure what week was that, uh, uh, Peter? That was- I think it was uh, mid-April, about a month after the accident. I see. Uh, we got together and you know, in that month, you know, a little bit storytelling, but you know, I, when, when the earthquake happened, I've been in Tokyo for the last 30 years, and my family is actually from Ishinomaki, which was the worst hit city during the tsunami itself. And in the first two days, you now when I was talking to Joey about Geiger counters, I was actually really trying to figure out what happened to my whole family in law at that time. And, uh, and it took some, by the time we met, I had put together, and we can, you know, we can talk about it later, we put together my first little Geiger counter circuit, and we were tinkering and trying to figure out things. but. Uh, by the time we were we were figuring out what to do, and we literally didn't have the equipment to go out and do what we wanted to do. We had experimented with crowdsourcing that didn't work because people didn't have the Gaga counters and all these things. We only had a few, and then you came, and uh, that was I think around April 15 or something or 16 when the new context conference was there, and you came up with the idea. Why don't we put it on a car? And for people that don't know me, I have never driven a car in my whole life, so I wouldn't have thought about that. But but you, you, you said, Peter, we have to put this on a car. And he said, yeah, that's great. You know, I'll figure it out, except I can't drive. So and then we found people to drive the car and everything. And we did, in one week later, we did build the, 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 the first big IG, so to speak. But today, I want to, uh, you know, we want to talk a little bit about some, some new things. And uh, for, for, for many uh, people that know SafeCost, they know, know we started with measuring radiation, and we're still very much doing that. And today, we're measuring, uh, of course, in Fukushima again. But also a couple of years ago, and, and uh, we started to look at air quality. And uh, Sean uh, has been working on that together with me and a lot of volunteers. And, and you started to pick that up about two, three years ago uh, in terms of how can we bring that to the next level. And, uh, and maybe you want to, maybe uh, if you can describe a little bit what the journey is. And I have a box here, so the moment. Uh, one moment we're kind of at the right moment. I'll open it up and, and we'll reveal what's in this box. So, so over to you, uh, Ray. What, what's up in this box? Sure. Well, let me give you a little bit of a tiny bit of history before that, because Sean yes. was really the one who was um, 
uh, leading in, in the realm of um, trying to figure out if we could apply some of the same uh, um, citizen science methodologies that we're using to air that we had been using in radiation. Sean um, uh, built and, and had built a, the, the very first version of, um, of an air sensor, which I believe it was just called SafeCast Air at the time. And yes, as Peter has there, that was the, um, uh, the first version of, of something that I had built, not as elegant as what, uh, what Sean would do, but this was a, a fairly uh, a multifunction device, two radiation sensors, two different kinds of air sensors, um, uh, solar panel. Um, uh, this was my first foray since the 70s uh, into, back into um, hardware. Um, I've done mostly software in my, my life. It looks a little bit like RD2, you know, <laughs> a bit Star Wars really? feeling here. Yes. Well, we learned. It was, in my, it was a tremendous learning experience because um, uh, trying, to, trying to cite the, these boxes, uh, were, you know, in a place where there was enough sun was, was a challenge. Trying to backhaul the data um, from these devices um, back out to the uh, the internet was a challenge. The initial device was LoRa based. Uh, LoRa is a, a a low power wireless technology that dribbles um, data out. That was the first version, the SolarCast that we started experimenting in cellular. And so, to make a long story short, um, uh, over time, as we did multiple generations of devices. Um, I became committed to getting lots and lots of these things out there to make an impact. And so we wanted to solve the, the citing problem, the problem of getting, some, getting it out there uh, without drilling holes in the outside of your house, without trying to figure out how to run a power cord. Um, uh, easy backhauling of data um, by cell, cellular and, and uh, wireless. And so Peter, uh, uh, the grand opening, um, I got a box here. It just it just arrived. Uh, you know, it just literally arrived here in Tokyo, and you know, opening up the box, and in there we find some adhesives. No, we're going to talk about that in a moment, I guess. And uh, uh, and here it is. So the air note. That's so Ray, it. what is the air note? The air note is a very simple um, air quality measurement device. Um, it is hopefully the opposite of many of the uh, surveillance-centric uh, IoT devices that you might have uh, experienced in the home. This thing does one thing, and it does it very well, and that is to uh, measure outdoor air quality where you are. All you have to do is um, uh, conceptualize, do I have a reasonably sunny window that I can attach this to, a window that opens, or a place that I could stick it on on the outside? And uh, there are little- uh, We have it right here in Tokyo. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you can see it. Yep. And it's light enough. It's designed in an enclosure that's, that's intentionally very, very lightweight so that it, it doesn't present you know, a burden when it's hanging up there. And we use these uh, wonderful little things called command strips. They're Velcro strips, but they're ex extremely easy to remove. If you want to uh, put it somewhere else, you can just snap it off. Uh, so it's, it's good adhesive, but it's also easily removable. And the concept here is that all you have to do if you buy it, and it's, uh, it's very affordable, it's a $150 US um, uh, and no ongoing subscription. All you have to do is open it up, um, you know, put the Velcro strips on, find a window to put it on, uh, turn the power switch on, on the bottom, um, and uh, uh, put it outside. And that's it. You don't have to go through a registration process. You don't have to connect it to your Wi-Fi. Um, it just works. And what happens is that um, on the inside, uh, what you might be able to see is um, it it reports, uh, we have very clean air on the inside here. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> it reports the, uh, um, the va a value that you select, but by default PM 2.5. Um, uh, and it, it has little indications like, hey, I'm trying to get a GPS location or hey, I'm, I'm uh, you know, using cellular, but that's it. So at a glance, 
you or your family can find out what the air quality is on the outside. Yeah, I was just what looking at the one we have here on the window, and and uh, the, air, the 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 peak. Is, is it? Yeah, seventeen point five. Seventeen point five. Yeah. Okay, so so that is the the air quality. It is a particular matter. For people that don't know that, that's the amount of, of small particles that, that we have in, you know, in, in, in the air. So it's sitting here on the safe cause window outside this. You may have noticed we are blessed with a highway next to our office that is zipping by. Uh, but it gives an indication of how, what the air quality is. Uh, just to put things in perspective, you know, people always talk about you know, the smog in China or whatever that would have an index of around eight 900 or way up there. So, uh, this is by all means not actually very, uh, very, uh, you know, bad on, on a larger scale. But the thing what is interesting about measuring air quality is, is that most people don't realize it changes dramatically throughout the day. It goes up and down quite a bit because human activity goes up, down a bit, quite up, up and down. And during the night, it goes down because we're not driving around and we're not doing uh, as many things as we do during the time, daytime. So, so I have, I have the, the sensor here. And, and, and Ray, I just wanted to repeat, are you, are you meaning, saying that this is $150 only? I mean, running one hundred fifty on, on, dollars one time, and that's one that's time, right? And right, so because because you know, I might, when we started a couple of years ago, you know, we had to buy SIM cards, and it was, it was like fifty dollars a month to run it, and you know, it was very hard to get IoT going. But you know, this is all included, no no subscriptions, no need to do anything, and this works in in how many countries? One hundred and thirty-seven. So you have you have. You just take it out of the box, stick it on the window, and, and you're, you're good to go. And that's it. And that's it. And the, the other kind of interesting thing um, was that it was our goal that at a glance, you could get a sense, you could get immediate feedback on what it's like outside. If you're wondering, should, should my, you know, if it's a particularly bad time, there are fires in the area, should I let my children out uh, you know, to play today, you know, or should, should we keep them inside? You get Im that immediate feedback. But also, this thing has cellular in it, and it's transmitting those readings up, and, and those, those readings are becoming part of the SafeCast open data set. Essentially, by agreeing to use this, you are agreeing to allow that data to be um, licensed to Creative Commons Zero, like the entire uh, SafeCast data set. Um, and so, if you happen to have a cell phone, um, and uh, you look at the, um, uh, the device, it recognizes the, the QR code and uh, brings you to, um, uh, oh, there it is, uh, brings yeah, so, you to yeah. the historical data. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, yes, yeah, so we're trying to also take it, yeah, I, I have a, I have it on Zoom here in the studio here in at our office. Yeah, perfect. Yes. So this is your uh, this is your yours at in, in Boston. This is this is what it is uh, here on the window right now, and so you can see that it's pretty, it's kind of came down. But but last two days the air was uh, was a bit worse actually than it is right now, and um, it's kind of raining right now in Tokyo. So that may have something to do with it as well. You can then you know you can see the location. No, I'm doing something that doesn't really work well in reverse, but uh, so so you can you can see this and you can see what the location is where the safe cost office is, and and the data that is coming off these sensors, uh, Ray, this this is going to our servers in safe cost where we disseminate the data as open data, public data, for anybody and everybody to use. And I think as there's going to be way more sensors out there, we finally will have a very large data set to work on. Um, for radiation, we built it over the last 10 years. We have over 160 million measurements we have done with all volunteers worldwide. Largest data set in existence, largest open data set. A lot of researchers, and tonight, you know, or later in the, you know, later in the show, because tonight it depends where you are, uh, with our, with our, uh, with the roundtable program, we're going to talk a lot about how researchers have, have found safe cards to be a source of, uh, of, of, of doing more research simply because that data is not available. And I think for air quality data, interestingly enough. There is a lot of data out there, but there's not a lot that is being measured globally in a consistent way like we did for radiation. And, and also make it very affordable. This equipment used to be very, very expensive. Actually, 10 years ago when SafeCo started, these sensors didn't even exist, right? And a lot of the technology in this box didn't even exist two, three years ago. Um, I'm, you know, uh, from, from a, uh, so Ray, from where we saw, you know, we went from, from this solar panel, what is it, three years ago? That's right, that's right. To this solar panel, 
And for people that are in the know, it is not uh, trivial to run a device it's with such a small solar panel that has to use uh, you know, wireless communications and run a, a sensor and everything. So I think that's where, 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 the, where all the, the effort went. And also we learned a lot from our deployments over the years of sensors that there is many things that can go wrong and the simpler the better. Uh, but making it simple is, is the hardest piece. So I think we've reached a major breakthrough. And I just want to kind of uh, uh, check with Sean, you know, uh, who's, who's uh, on the line and, and you know, you, uh, Sean, you're, you got your air note. Uh, my air note is stuck to a window about four blocks away from here because uh, I don't have a window at my house where I can use it. <laughs> you need a sunny window. This is the only thing you need. And we know that not everybody has a sunny window. So, but Well, um, I'm in Vancouver where it's overcast and rainy most of the time anyway, and my house faces north. North. So uh, there's only a couple windows that get more than a few minutes of direct sun a day. And... Uh, we tried, but that was not enough to keep it keep it going. <laughs> it but the trick is, is, you get the sensor, and then you just give it to a good neighbor or friend yep. to put yeah, it exactly. on the window, and that's it. all. Around. You just share it, and, and the whole point is, is we want to share the data, and uh, and then you you can see from your mobile phone or whatever what's what's up in the neighborhood, anyway. So you, it's it's the block away or uh, as as well, I, right? That's awesome. But I would like to. I just want to take this time for one minute though to um, to say how much admiration I have for the SafeCast project and for the, 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 the uh, experimentation spirit of the, of the volunteers. Over the course of these years, I have learned an immense amount um, on this journey. As, you know, as, as Peter said, you know, we, the, we started with um, you know, a, a Geiger counter and it was, it would, it was much lar larger than this. I don't know if you have one within reach, Peter, but you know, this is the workhorse of, of the SafeCast project measuring uh, radiation. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, then we went to the, you know, the large size one, then we uh, began to shrink it. And this was, the, this was a smaller solar panel version, you know, on the way um to uh to where we where we got and we're always experimenting um so for example uh yeah as as you can see there and, and you can you can open it and i and ray i know you you've been an avid collector of all our of all our uh, intermediate prototypes <laughs> indeed indeed and there are some that that have never made it into broad production for example this is a device that yes. um my 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 patient wife had it on her car for almost a year. And what this does is um, it's, it's got a, a, a radiation sensor and, and you know, power supply and a cellular modem. Um, and it runs on AAA batteries and you just have to replace them twice a year. Um, and it, and it, it, so it, Ray, we, we don't have that one in our collection here yet, but no, we do want we to keep that. things we, up to date. <laughs> that's all, and, that's, that's fantastic. And as Peter was, as P, as you may be able to see on Peter's table, we've taken, we've also taken the the air note as it is right now, and we're trying to say how can we increase the ubiquity of radiation measurement by turning uh, the air note into a radiation device by just simply replacing, you know, the um, uh, the air sensor with a Geiger tube um, inside yes. and, yes. and power. So yeah, so so the, so it's a little bit hard to see, but but we have two we have two versions here. This is the air quality which is currently available, and this is the uh, the, the prototype version that we're still kind of finalizing and tuning and, and currently calibrating. But this is the air quality. You know, the both are the same. So you could have two on your window doing different measurements next to each other, right? And you know maybe over over the years there could be a small collection and you can pick and choose what you would <laughs> like to measure. Uh, and I think maybe the radiation. Them, maybe we can uh, make them in different flavors. Exactly, and 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 uh, I, I think also so Ray. I think on the radiation one, I'm I'm very sure a lot of people are also interested in in having the radiation version, and we'll you know hopefully not into the distant future we will talk about that again uh, yep. as to how that uh, is going to evolve and, and how people can get that one as well. Uh, but for now, what is available and people can start pre-ordering is the Aeronaut uh, yep. uh, for ridiculous, you know, knowing what 
the costs were of the previous generations, etc. And the ability of this to run outside, because I, I meet a lot of people and say, yeah, I can make this thing and it works inside. And, I, and, and it's also important to measure air quality inside your house because you breathe the air inside and outside. But for us, for safe cars, it's always been so important to be able to measure outside because that is the common space that we share and share that information, right? So, and making things work outside, just even if it's on the window outside, makes things incre incrementally hard because of powering things, making it weatherproof, uh, making it last a whole lot more, you know, it's, it's raining right now and you, we can see the water dripping off the, of the thing, but all of that needs to be brought into, into space. And if you wire it up through the house, it becomes very hard to, for most people to install. So, so that is the huge difference in my mind between some of the things that you can buy for your home, which is important, but this is really allows us as citizen science, as people together, to start measuring our environment uh, rapidly. And today we'll talk about the air node uh, as, as to what it, you know, how it impacts other things in, 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 uh, in, in many ways uh, as we go. If I, if I could right. just add one more thing and then, I, then I'll stop. I want to make sure that, um, that viewers understand that this was, this has been, an, uh, the, all of these devices, but also the AirNode have been a collaboration between volunteers at SafeCast who are just passionate about what they do and wanting to make a difference. And, um, uh, people who work for a commercial entity, a company of mine uh, called Blues Wireless. Um, I'm bringing that up because if you'd like to get an AirNote, um, you just go to blues.io, go into the store, and it's right there. Um, we're, we'll be shipping it in a couple weeks. Uh, there's some final fine tuning of the enclosure that's happening, um, uh, but we're super excited about it. Just go there and uh, order one, and it'll be uh, drop shipped uh, as soon as we can. Okay, so so I just wanted to see, I know there's a lot of people online. I just wanted to make a big shout out to to some of our, our, our special guests that have uh, already logged in. We're gonna feature them later, but I can see Miles O'Brien. I can see Mark Davidson. I saw uh, Watanabe Norio, uh, Konnichiwa, Ohayo gozaimasu. I'm seeing Junya Madeira, who is in the SafeCast follow car, is following our car. Uh, and uh, and we're all going to connect later in the day. I just wanted to connect to the car. You know, we're driving in Fukushima. I just wanted to see see if if uh, how things are going. Asbi, Joe, can you come online? Hi, Asbi, Joe, can you hear? You're on mute right now. Yes. If you... Hi, howdy. Hey, um, howdy, we howdy. Are in in J Village, uh, and uh, here I am. A rainy day. Rain and uh, we're in day village we arrived and uh you know i'll just sort of show around we're, are we ready to start now Kelsey, can we keep ray on are we ready to go yeah so we have ray on the line and ray just wants to say hi and maybe we can have a chat chat and if, if joe is around sure. or sure uh joe's here and uh emma's over here and here's uh I'll, I'll just sweep around and show you the scenario uh here there's uh Jin Yamadera. And Emu, and the SafeCast car, and a fire truck. Yes. And the famous white, uh, you know, dome uh, sports facility at J Village. Yes. Uh, and the follow car. So it's um, rainy, but this is, um, you know, an important uh, historical place, right? Regarding the post disaster. Yes. And J Village was was something that was fairly new when it, when the accident happened. Yeah, Madera, you want to come over here? Yeah. And it, it wasn't it isn't it wasn't it a sport facility specifically for for J -so for soccer or something? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And put him on Nihongo Mashabri Maske, though. Ima J Village ni Maskara, J Village is only Rake Stickina Basho de Shotokani Fukushima and no Jiko no Ato. So J Village was built for uh, training for uh, Japanese J, J League soccer. That's why it's called J Village. Uh, and after the disaster, because it's pretty close to Fukushima, but a safe distance to Fukushima Daiichi, but a safe distance, it was used as the emergency staging area for all of the military assistance and the helicopters and the, the medical and everything. Uh, U.S. military troops were here uh, and uh, and now it's, you know, turned back into a sports facility uh, planning to be used for the Olympics. I got a quote, I got, Zuto Jiko Nato ga taihen na, ano, so you can uh, no. あの、ま、本当にあの、あの、
Do you see any action there? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I, I, will, I will sort of look around. It's There's really some kids early. playing soccer. There's some kids playing soccer. Uh, you see them way over there. They're playing soccer in the rain. Maybe. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a few people around, but not much, not much. Uh, so it's really kind of a strange place because um, you know it turned from such a disaster response center back into something similar to normal life. I'm having trouble with my umbrella. Back into something similar to normal life, but still a little weird, right? So Hongkiri Mai ga kinky no toki ni wa sugoku. Uh, it's a little strange. And one of the big issues had been, uh, you know, they cleaned this up incredibly, all of these fields and parking lots, etc., uh, to prepare for the Olympics. Uh, 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 we're going to make a big show, have Olympic events here in J Village, in Fukushima. Uh, and then, uh, like, Two years ago, end of end of 2019, Greenpeace came and probably within moments <laughs> found a hot spot <laughs> that would needed to be cleaned up. Uh, and this was just ridiculous. I got a more issue came a Joe Saint Skip and Oni and Greenpeace like the Mosuga Kamani Takai hotspot needs get that. And and we could figure it was probably it was on the edge of a parking lot at the bottom of kind of a hill, the kind of place where cesium would collect. You know, what I said, you know, what I took already. So we're thinking, if this was the most important place to clean up, how come they didn't do a better job? You know? So and I think we'll be joined by Ari pretty soon, right? Hello? Yes. So, so, hey, so, so, Asbi, uh, just a... Uh, I know Joe is there, and I, I see Ray, and you know maybe uh, if Joe can say a few things, and Ray, you know you, yeah, you guys Joe. have. Yeah. Well, I was yourself. remembering the first time Peter, the first time you and I were here, the road behind us, just to my right, was a, just a, from where we were to the horizon. It seemed like with huge emergency response vehicles, and it was uh, it was such a weird uh, experience to be. Uh, this is basically as far as we could get at that time to get uh, to measure radiation. Joe, how how long how far after the event was was that that you were up there? Uh, that would have been in April. It was the second big Geige drive, so it would have been like I don't know April twentieth. So about six weeks after the maybe uh, five or six weeks after the disaster. So Joe, I'm a youth. No, I had met the kid at the Peter Santo. He found this. Ne, the Shigatsu Hatsuka Boro was. The big Geige no, I know test or big Geige no drive. I did. 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 And this is also where Prime Minister Nato Khan, his helicopter landed. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was all full of, you know, emergency response. So, 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 Asmi, it would be nice if you could also uh, introduce June and Imo and have them. Yeah, let's go see June and Imo. And, I will flip and, around uh, and talk to June and Imo. So, oh, June and Hello, Imu. Good morning. Get closer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Can you say louder? Kikoimasu ka? Jun san, kikoimasu ka? Yeah, we are from uh, Aizawa Kamarasu. Jun san, yeah. I, can, I can hardly see your face, so maybe. You may you want to get a little yeah. bit closer yeah. and see yeah. yeah, we're going to see Hi, you. Hi, June. Hi. <laughs> Too close. <laughs> Too close. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, he's fashionable. And here's Emu. Hello. And we're we'll working hard yourself. <laughs> yeah. And and the vehicle, and there's some students in the car that with Jun's car, yeah. the black car, which is a follow vehicle. So Jun san wa ano J Village wa ano hajimete kita wa itsu datta ni. Uh actually this is my first time. Your first time? I was yeah. asking Jun when he first came to J Village, this is his first time. Yeah. Yeah. I saw so many news, but yeah, lots of news. And Jun san, so, where are you from? Where, where are you based? Uh, I'm based in Aizu Wakamatsu. Yeah, so Aizu is the western part of Fukushima Prefecture. Didn't get much fallout, uh, but still it's part of Fukushima and has the same reputational problems as the rest. Yeah, it's a hundred. Yeah. Oh, some guys are, are, wait. 
What's a sound? You hear this? Yeah. Yes. So everything's normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Life, life, life. <laughs> nothing as good as life. And yeah. and uh, yes. And what about Emu? Emu, how about you? This is your first time to J Village. Yes, this is my first time to J Village. So should I do? Uh, yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me better on this yes. mic? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, <laughs> everybody's going away. So yes, this is my first time in J Village. Um, I've been involved in SACAS since 2018. Um, I did my bachelor's and master's in Tokyo Noko Daigaku, and I'm doing my doctors now in citizen science. So, yes, Miesta, um, should I say it in Japanese again, maybe? No, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So, Miesta, I'm very excited. えっと、環境についての東京の高大学で学部と接種を取りますので、今は市民科学の研究、ドイツの大学の方で博士課程で勉強しています。テミーズに来るのは今日が初めてです。よろしくお願いします。そうそう。Tell them a report about 10 years after Fukushima. And um, I also had a radio interview last week about um, agriculture in Fukushima. えっと、先週、先月ですね。えっと、ドイツのテレビ番組でえっと、福島の10年後の現状について、テレビ番組をやったんですけど、そこでと翻訳作業に関わったのと、先週 は、えっと、ドイツラジオのインタビューで福島のえっと、原発事故後の農業についてのインタビューをしました。ありがとうございます。Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Emu, we met in the Hong Kong um, two years ago at a at a big um, workshop organized by a National Geographic for citizen science projects in Asia. And uh, she liked our project, like SACAS, and instantly got involved and has now become a very, very active and important member while doing her graduate work. So she's a scientist and a great communicator. And I'm not surprised that the German TV uh, people and radio people are picking up on her because she's trilingual, uh, German, Japanese, English, uh, and looks good on camera. So I think we'll see a lot more of uh, of her. Yes, that, okay. that would be, would be fantastic. So, so, so Asbi, I, I, I think everybody is kind of curious, what are we going to do today with the car and where are we going to go and give us a little bit of a, a, a walkthrough of the schedule and, and, and yeah. while you do that, maybe somebody can hold your camera so that it doesn't wobble too much. Yeah, um, maybe yeah. Joe, Joe can come hold the camera. Yeah, that and, would be uh, great. So, it's hard in the rain. Okay, yeah. Hang on, let's turn around. Yep. Are we good? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Yes. Um, yeah, so today, as we said, we're starting in J Village, which is sort of south of uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And the car, the shift gas car, will be driving northward uh, over the course of the day, stopping at several places. The next stop for us will be Tomioka, Tomioka Station. Uh, we'll, we've been visiting there a lot. There's some things to talk about there. Uh, we will go to um, uh, meet with uh, Mr. Sasaki and Karin Tyra, our good uh, uh, colleagues, uh, who will go into the exclusion zone and report from inside the exclusion zone in Okuma. Uh, then we will go to uh, the approach road right in front of Fukushima Daiichi, where we have uh, placed a new sensor recently. Uh, and then uh, we will go to Ono Station, which is an unusual area that's in the exclusion zone, but they reopened the station. It's kind of very weird. Uh, then we will go to um, the area called Kutaba, uh, and then Ukedo, which was very seriously destroyed by the tsunami and also has radiation issues, and there are some memorials and there are things to see there. Uh, and then we will head to Odaka, which is in the southern part of Minami Soma City, uh, and uh, we will have a big, like a one-hour session with local residents, uh, remembering 10 years ago and thinking about the future. And during the course of the day, we'll have people logging in from all over Japan and overseas, and commenting and uh, there will be the musical interludes as well and some other uh, you know sessions that uh, will be running out of your office there Tokyo right can, can you plug the Bigaigi cast uh, we also have uh, a new uh, variant of the Bigaigi called the Bigaigi cast uh, 
uh, it's a normal big ID, but it is uh, sending a stream of data live to a web page. Uh, and we will be able to, starting from now, you will be able to follow uh, the car and follow the radiation levels uh, where we are by uh, watching that page. And I think we're set up to display that page through one of the Zoom, uh, Zoom channels, right? Yes. Uh, so, so uh, for for those of you are who are following us on YouTube, uh, in the description there is actually the the URL. Uh, if you click on that, you will go and see uh, the live data as it is being collected by that sensor. And you can also, with that, you can follow where we're going. And uh, in that uh, thing, there is an option on the top. You can kind of select the last three hours or last six hours or last five minutes. So play with that a little bit to see kind of what works. But uh, if you hit it for the last three days, you can also see where the car was uh, the last three days when, when, when we were measuring. Uh, you can then also go to the SafeCost map on safecost.org. Uh, and there you can compare the levels with levels that we measured over the last 10 years. In the map, there is a function to go back in time. There's a time machine built in uh, and, and that allows you to select data as we measured it literally 10 years ago versus what it is today. And it gives you a very good idea how these levels have changed over time. And speaking out of my own measurement experience doing that over many years, these levels have come down quite a bit. I think J Village, where you guys are right now, my memory tells me about 1 to 1.5 microsieverts at that time. Uh, Joe may have a, and it was very yes. spotty there as well. Joe, right, you know, if you walk, would walk around there, it would change quite a bit. I think today, I'm not sure what you guys are measuring. It's, it's probably 0 0.15 or something. Yeah, it's 0 0.12 here. This place has been very thoroughly remediated. Uh, it was, this place was actually never all that contaminated compared to places further north. Both here, uh, which is in Nadaha, uh, was officially evacuated. This was the southern boundary of the exclusion zone at the earliest days. But the, even from the earliest days, the contamination here was moderate compared to places north and north uh, northwest. Yeah. Can you translate that? Okay. Um so the sign again that the code no subtitle to include what I not to do it. So ma some reason to say that Narafa Machi that eh ここの JB is a hoka no baso ni kurabete jousen sagyo ga yousen teki ni okonawara ta koto ga arimasu. Uh I think we lost you Emu. Um I think that was the part. You're sitting too close to each other. Uh, you're on mute. As Asby. But you're both on mute, I guess, right now. Okay, she's done. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you need if you do that, you need to have one needs to be on mute. <laughs> yes, exactly. We muted, it. We, not, we muted it, but it still feeds back for some reason. Yeah, you know, it's it, one of those one of those things. It's one of those things, but it's good that it all works. We have great reception today, by the yeah. way. The, the picture yeah, quality not bad is at fantastic, all. and uh, that's also a thing. You know, when we were there ten years ago, many people uh, may not know, but most of the communication was destroyed during the during the earthquake, and it was very difficult to use uh, your mobile phone to call people. Actually, the mobile phone internet connectivity was actually better than phone connectivity, but it took years before normal uh, reception was restored in the area where you guys are driving now. And even today, if you go off road, so to speak, of the main highways, etc., there are still areas where only few cell phone, the cell phone reception can be almost nothing because uh, the exclusion zone or areas have not been repopulated and they have put the cellular towers only there where people are right now. But if you go into the more into the forest or you drive to Itate or something to the mountains, then uh, it's very, very spotty still even today. Well, in Japan, wherever you go, it's very, very good. But uh, this kind of is still after 10 years, there's so much uh, that uh, that is still left as it was 10 years ago in that area specifically. Most of the areas outside of the exclusion zone, though, uh, are very much recovered in, in many, many ways. Uh, radiation levels and etc. have have come down quite uh, quite significantly, but I think later today we're going to drive through uh, the exclusion zone uh, or part of the zone where things are more or less uh, uh, as they were left ten years ago, and that gives a good impression as to you know what what has changed and what has not changed in those years. So I'm just looking at the clock and I'm seeing Miles is Miles O'Brien is on the line. But uh, what about Ari? <laughs> I was waiting for Ari. <laughs> I'm not sure if Ari is online. Ari is online? Okay. Ari, you dropped out. 
Okay, if it's not there, it's then right. yeah, my mistake actually, actually my mistake. Oh. <laughs> the the page. Yeah, no, we're 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 Ari, please come online. Hey everybody, uh, how's it going? Can you see me and hear me? You want me to hold the camera again? Uh, Hello. I think I'm Hello. Yes, I'm Are you there? Good. Um, can you see me and hear me? Yes, I'm... we can. Okay, great. How's it going, everybody? Hey, Thanks, Ari, how are you doing? <laughs> long time no see. It's been a long time. Um, how, how are you doing? I guess. Yeah, uh, rainy. Rainy, but good. Say Sorry? that again. I said it's rainy, but it's I'm good. just saying it's a great event. Thank you very much. New York. I'm playing here from New York. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so Ali, can you can you introduce yourself briefly? Where are you and what you do? Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was connected to Safe Pass through uh, 2016. I was in Japan, uh, 15 to 16, on a Fulbright National Geographic uh, Digital Storytelling Fellowship, where I was reporting on from the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombings from Hiroshima and Nagasaki through to the fifth anniversary of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Uh, filming throughout the, the way and uh, interviewing people and writing stories for National Geographic. When I was connected to uh, the work that SafeCast was doing, and I knew that, that anyone could help me understand what was going on in Fukushima in terms of uh, the radiation levels and where exactly things were and what was going on, it would be uh, you all wonderful people. And I'm so, I've been blown away by not just the work that you do, but how you communicate the work. and. Um, you know what you've done to like make everybody understand what I think Ali you your connection is not working well or just chopped out um so Asbi can you can yeah. you tell us a little bit uh, uh, yeah. Ali san wa also in Japanese Ali Besa ga uh ma photo journal de shashin ka de documentary eiga mo sukutte ru shi多分2016年頃に福島に来てナショナルジオグラフィックのためにきてあいろいろ取材してて、で、彼がセーフキャスの話はその前に聞いてて、ま、紹介になって結構ま、東京であったり、いろいろ話したんですよ。ずっとま、
meant to that their eyewitness testimony to not be forgotten. And so um, yeah. we can avoid a nuclear catastrophe in the future. That's a lot. Do you want to? Great. I'm going to translate. So, Ari san no oji san ga, ano, 1945 nen no, ano, Hiroshima to Nagasaki ni genbak o toshita hikoki notuta hito deshita. So, no project no kanke shita datta. De, sori de, zuto so no story ga, jibun no kodomi toki ar zuto kita dan desh, oji san no story. So, no ato wa, ano, hibaksha to no connection dekite, rinaki dekite, sori de, byo ga wa, ano, yapari kike nai to dami datte. それで、彼のナショナルグラフィックの一つの大きなプロジェクトがやっぱり日本に来て、その被爆者の話を聞いて、残して、歴史に残すんですね。だから、ちょっと珍しい立場ですよ。あまあ、それでずっとそういうたくさんあの関係の,あの活動がずっとやってますね。Okay, I explain that. <laughs> Thank you very much.、Uh, and so, you know,、uh, sorry for the hurried presentation. I'm, you know, kind of a c o c k i n g this connection right now.、Um, and so, <laughs> Welcome to the modern world.、Um, <laughs> nah. But、um, I think, though, the same year I arrived to Japan for the first time, actually, I received a grant to write a book、uh, about this whole connection、uh, March 10th, 2011,、uh, in, New York, in Colorado time. Yeah. And so that night, actually, the news broke、um, that there was a massive earthquake, my friend told me, and that, you know, I should, aren't I going to Japan? Isn't that just something? And I said, oh, Uh, having read all the Wikipedia pages, that like Japan has like 20 earthquakes a day, it's normal. And he goes, No, 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 this wasn't normal. And so, and obviously, we it was this situation. And so, when I went to Japan to like、uh, research the you know the devastation that had happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, some of the people who connected me thought it would be very important for me to go to、um, volunteer in the tsunami relief. And so I actually、um, went to Ofunato in Iwate Prefecture via all hands volunteers、um, for about five days, intended, and then stayed for about two months because I, I couldn't、uh, leave. And I extended my trip that, and just solely volunteered and, and wasn't researching, but I was just present and being there to you know, not understand what had gone through, but realizing the full scale of what was happening was a whole massive、um, you know, Awakening in a whole different sense that was going on in this time period. And, and, or was it, I guess, as, as we had just written for、um, The Economist and saying that it may or may not have been the great awakening moment that we had hoped it was, but、um, in, did it be, beget to me a, a sort of connection in that this is a tragedy that has befallen Japan, I think, multiple times. And I think we had a duty to pay attention to what the, is going on. And I think.、Um, Through the eyes of the survivors, but in a different sense, the eyes of the people who are active in this, in this work, to, I guess, to connect it to Fukushima. Do you want to maybe interpret from? I don't I know. Guess, like, I think so. How much、but、you're interpreting. All, so, when, when did you come? How, how soon after the disaster did you come?、Uh, five, uh, I, came, I arrived in August 2011. Okay, okay. So, the Adi san ga, I have a very good idea of the Rikshi or the story. Just a whole pack of Jose King Mura, the Sono, I know. 分かった日があの2011年の,あの3月10日だった。だからこのあサンティーシの前の日で、それでそれが非常に嬉しかったんで、次の日は知り合いは大きな地震があったよ、日本で。で、アリさんが日本はね、地震がいっぱいあるからね、あの1日20回あるじゃないですか、大したことないじゃないですか、違う違う、これ本当に大きかったよと。そしてニュース見て、その福島の事故を分かって、やっぱりもうずっと自分のまあ、原爆の歴史と何か関連性があるかなと思ってて、やっぱり来ないとダメだと。それでいろいろな方で、まあ、あのこの,あの東北の方のボランティアとかにつ,つながってあの、11年の8月に日本に来て、ですぐ東北、実はオフナットに行ったんですね。そこの、あのあ何ですか、そのあひあ人たちとかね、そういう。岩手,岩手県の、ね、オフナットにいてそうそうそうあのあの、避難者とかのボランティアとか手伝ったりしてて、で福島の方に行ったりしたんですよね。だからずっとやっぱりこのストーリーは大事だと。もちろん原爆と原子力は違うだけど、あ両方の方では被害者は出る可能性があるんですね。だからそれがその人たちのストーリーは忘れていけないね。I think I got all that. So maybe think so too. <laughs> one, one final thing. So here we are at J Village. Yeah, yeah. Which is planning to be used for Olympic events. Yeah. Although we don't know what's going to happen, it sounds like they're not going to have spectators. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. What, yeah. What's the general public opinion 
around you in the U.S. that you hear regarding having Olympic events in Fukushima? I think the feeling is. Let me, let me translate first. Ima kite na ano sa J Village sa Fukushima de Olympic no ano event pa ga yaru no wa America to ga ne mina no iti wa do no kanji de shouka. Yes, thank you. Well, you know, it's America, so asking the general feeling is kind of like impossible. But I'll tell you some generally like, kind of different views I've heard. Um, the one thing I've heard is that it's not in great taste to really have it uh, in a disaster area and sort of that's a celebratory thing. Uh, it's sort of like playing ball on, you know, a graveyard in a sense. And, and it's, it's that, 10 years. まず、あの、いろんな日、アメリカだから行けないいっぱいあるからでも立ってる自分の日って話はいや、こういう大変な悲劇があったところで被害者がいっぱいいたところにこういうあの、お祝いみたいの喜びとか楽しみのことがちょ
is that right? And a Peabody and a DuPont. And he's been to uh, Japan after the tsunami and uh, Fukushima accident six times. And I think I met you several times when he when you were in uh, Safecast office in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Welcome, yes. Miles. Congratulations, Welcome, Miles. Safecast, on uh, turning a, you know what they say, never waste a good crisis, right? You took a crisis and you made something really positive, not just for Japan, but for the whole world, the whole idea of democratizing data, of allowing citizens to get their own facts and not have to rely on people they may or may not trust is incredibly powerful. And in today's world, you, you guys were so far ahead of your time in realizing how important this is in the world of this crazy echo chamber of fake news that we live in. I just, uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of you. I'm glad I was there near the beginning. And uh, I wish in all my heart, I was there right now, helping celebrate in person, telling some stories for the news hour and others. So uh, Miles, tell me about your uh, report on SafeCast. What was it about and when was it? Well, I came about four months after uh, the meltdown. I have I have the story queued up. I don't. Do you want to see a little bit of it, or is that uh, yeah, sure. do we not have time? Yeah, we could put that on. I don't know. I don't. We'll see. I don't know how the audio is going to go here, but it, so there'll be some familiar faces. I, I've got to ask one question though. The question that's been on my mind since I started watching this is that the same car? I yes, it is. It is. Same car. Same <laughs> car. So boss, you must have that thing rigged 20 ways to Sunday. I cannot believe it's still running. Unbelievable. All right. That's that's awesome. That is totally awesome. Yes, right, it, so it, it, more, Miles, more, more recently, it is it's starting to look more and more like the Bluesmobile from the Blues Borders car. Uh, we're losing parts. Uh, for those who are online, I want to make safe cost car go faster. We do have a donation option yeah, on our website. Just want to mention that. And back to you, Miles. Yeah, there there it is. Um, I, Joe, do you remember? Can you see Joe? Or are you just listening? Joe's driving, uh, but Joe can oh, hear and imagine. Well, yeah, that's, that's never stopped him before. So uh, <laughs> uh, so this is when we went to that um, that school. Do you remember going that's to that at school? The Minu, that's the uh, Nanaha Minuti Elementary School. It's about, I, I think we're about a kilometer from it right now. Did you yeah. hear that? We're very close to that school right now. In oh, why don't you pull yeah, in we and can, give us We can update. hear Joe clearly I, as we. All right, What's let that? me just try playing this thing and see if you, if you just tell me if you can hear it. Uh, I don't Can I share a screen here? How do I do that? Uh, click on share screen. Yeah. Click on share screen. It's good to have a technical guy. Middle with you. bottom. Yes, you know. There screen, is a says. green button. Says uh, share screen. Green button, share screen. Here we go. Yep. Share screen. All right. And we will play well, this bad boy just for a few minutes. It's a 10 minute piece because I'm kind of, I, I fall in love with my words sometimes. But um, all right. So hopefully, are you seeing uh, yep. Yep. an anchor man? Sure. All right. All right. So here's a little bit. You'll recognize a few of these people. Uh oh. Not hearing it. Are you hearing it? No. Nope. Ah, drag. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to say. Uh, I think you might need to share uh, sound. On so your... if you if you share, there's an option. Uh, maybe you want to stop and, and share for yeah. a moment. There, and then when you share again and stop sharing, yeah. when you yep. share again, there is an option I in the share screen sharing. at the bottom that says share audio. Share. Oh, geez, you guys are good. Optimize for video clip. I might as well do that too, huh? Yeah, well, right, optimize for video go. clip and 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 share audio. Yeah, it's 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 right. they're they're working on it. This is this is live. This is good. Oh wait a minute now. Yeah, you must install the Zoom audio device. Oh, I blew. Yeah, just, just say okay. Just do it. Should I just do it? Should we do this? Oh no no, no just go go ahead. Yep. Maybe it works. Maybe it works. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Hang on one more time. We'll try it one more time. But in the meantime, we can talk about. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit while while we're downloading things. I'm sorry I didn't prepare better for this. Uh, I am working on my latest Nova, not on nuclear, uh, but on electric airplanes, which is really kind of an interesting thing on its own right. Um, I. Um, is Ray Ozzy still on? Ray, are you still are you there? Still yes, I am. Yes, I yeah. Am. Jump in for I, a moment I, there. I think this. I think your new device is awesome. I think that's a really cool thing. That's great. I really, I, I, I value that uh, opinion. Yeah. So thank you. Ah, oh, gosh darn it! I'm not going to be able to get the audio to work. Okay, but well, you can imagine a story where <laughs> we're driving yeah, around Joe Moras, Brian Moras. 
Peter Franken, uh, Bonner was in the car too. Yeah, everybody, like everybody has a guy gi, and uh, and uh, we're uh, we're look at look at this reading. This is five point one seven micro C. That I, Joe, do you remember where that was? It was up in the hills, uh, maybe toward Namie. Is that right? I can't see right now. Five point so. one. <laughs> uh, it's hard. It's hard to say, but uh, yeah, maybe was maybe it? near Namie. Yeah, yeah, must yeah. be that area. Namie had some high numbers. Yeah. Remember, yeah. Hey, Joe, do you remember like meeting this guy who was uh, remediating the soil and he was scraping up soil? I think it was in Manami Soma and uh, he was putting it in bags and yes. uh, which was great. Uh, two he inches was storing it in the driveway, remember? Yeah. And he didn't have a place to put it. So he stashed right. it behind a maternity hospital, which was just, oh. too, <laughs> which yeah, is right. classic, That's right? Can you, you can't make that oh. stuff up, right? Yeah. And, uh, but then, so we, a, after he left the bags behind, because he had no place to put them. Hey, have they found a place to put all this stuff by now? There's an Asby question if I ever um, heard one. I'll take that one, Miles. This is Asby. Uh, yeah. Yes, most of it, most of those big piles of bags are emptying out uh, and being stored uh, immediately north and south of Fukushima Daiichi in Futaba uh -huh. and Okuma in what's called the interim storage area, which actually today, later today, our volunteers will go and uh, sort of drive through there and show us the situation. So it's taking years. It's years behind schedule, but it's going forward. And a little well, later, we have it a, makes a good sense. In that area. It makes good sense to keep it near the plant, doesn't it? But when we were there, yeah. that, that was a 0.8 micro sieverts, and they left those bags. Or I, I assume those bags are gone by now. Maybe you guys can drive by and check it out. That's Fumio Asahi, who is my uh, local producer. She and Joe made all the magic for sure. This is my, when I first came, in July uh, for Frontline, we drove up uh, the coast through Sendai and uh, that was my first taste of the, uh, you know, the tsunami devastation, the tsunami and earthquake devastation. We ran into this woman, her, if you look behind her there, that slab was her house. And she was there because she missed her plants and she was there trying to transplant as many of the plants as she could. And she was living in one of those incredibly tiny, um, you know, temporary housing facilities. Who knows how long uh, she had to stay there. Um, do you uh, Joe, I, I don't think you were with me on this. This is a, he was at University of Sendai. He's a paleontologist who had done some research on previous tsunamis and had found um, uh, depositions in the soil, which indicated that the tsunami uh, distance could have gone much higher than TEPCO had predicted. Do you remember who I, I believe he was is? trying to contact TEPCO for the couple of years before the disaster even and was getting no uh, attention whatsoever. Completely got that? a step on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, he was fascinating, but you know, he was just, so, he was so frustrated because he'd been trying to tell them and they paid no attention. It would have cost them just a, I don't know, what, four or five million bucks to move one generator up on the cliff, up on the, you know, above the excavated area. Hey, Joe, do you remember going, there was a, 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 an elderly couple uh, rice farmer, small plot, probably about five miles or less from the um, plant. I, I forget which yeah. town. And we went back to their home. Do you remember that trip? That was in Nadaha. Yeah. So yeah. they, so they, was this, it, was it, was it, yeah. yeah, it was the first time she had gone back. And um, we, we went in through their house and it, and it had been in his family for 500 years, which, you know, of course in Japan, that's not too unusual. As for an American ear, that sounds, you know, Nothing is 500 years, right? It, much less one home. And uh, it was uh, at that moment, uh, and Joe, I think you were rolling on this. She, she realized, you know, she, she had, they had the, the stoic Japanese facade going and then she realized on camera that she wasn't coming back ever and uh, just lost it. It was, it, was one of the, I, I, it was one of the more emotional moments I've ever been through just because it really, the whole thing just hit me like a ton of bricks there. Uh, Joe, do you remember, can you see, I don't know if you can see that we did bring, everywhere we went, we had uh, Geiger counters, B. Geigies, you name it, we were taking data. Do you remember who this guy was? I can't see well enough from, my, from this other anyway, part. Anyway, this is, we were taking readings everywhere we went, but uh, and this was in, um, we were, they were planting rice um, in a manner that would probably reduce the uptake of cesium. And then there's the famous drone incident of uh, 2016. <laughs> famous uh, <laughs> and, and so this is if you'll see over here this is um 
Can you see Joe there? That's uh, that's where we're going right now, Miles. That's Tomioka. Yeah. Okay, Tomioka. Right so, so this is photographer Cameron Hickey, surrounded by, by the way, as we uh, were there and got caught flying the drone, in this case, interestingly, over Fukushima Daini, um, we, we got caught and uh, I, I had done my um, research and I knew that there was no rule against drone flying over the uh, nuclear facilities. Uh, but, um, you know, you couldn't fly a helicopter or a plane, but nobody had contemplated drones. They were still new enough, right? So we flew it and uh, somebody ratted us out. I can't remember. And- no, uh, just came across us on the road. Oh yeah, and 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 Joe Joe is, is a pretty guilty party. He looks really guilty because he starts running. Just he sees the cop, he runs. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so immediately they know we're up to something, right? So you know, because I the drone was in flight, we could have just said, "Oh, hey, officer," and just you know, hoped it stayed up long enough to uh, for the encounter. But uh, anyway, so the drones land, and wave after wave of cars come in. I think at one time, I don't know, Joe, did we have 20 officers around us? Getting close 18, to that, 20. I imagine. Yeah. And each miles, the, one of the critical things was that uh, the next time they came across us, we were launching the drone to get video of the uh, uh, one of the overhead radiation monitors, right? And another right. cop car pulled up, and it's two young cops from southern Japan, and they asked, what are you doing? And they, by that time, they had all our names because it's in everybody's notebook, right? Right. And these two cops, when they heard what we were doing, they parked their car diagonally across the road and blocked traffic so you yes. could get the shot. Yes. So it was really it was really a different experience each time we met uh, met policemen. Yeah, you guys uh, you guys would know what these armbands say, but a as each car came up, the, the guys seemed to have higher and higher rank. <laughs> and I think, you know, Joe, uh, we didn't, it was, uh, you, you were the full extent of our uh, Japanese uh, capability yeah. for that event. Uh, my sense of it was that they actually called Tokyo to see if there was yeah. anything they should do, right? They, they did. And what, what happened was, you know, about halfway through when it was clear that they weren't going to arrest us, they couldn't have anything arrested for, um, I started negotiating for how close we could get to the plant. And what they were saying was, no, well, you can't fly it over the plant. You can't fly it from here. I said, well, how about if we go up to the dam where the famous, you know, Fukushima television was shot, the television shot was taken from. And they said, oh, that's fine. I said, okay, well, that's seven kilometers. How about three kilometers? And they were asking us, you know, there was no rules. There was rules coming out. They were asking everyone to stand down on drones. And what I said was, well, this is maybe our last chance to do this legally. So we want to do it today. And eventually, remember, they gave us permission to fly where we were um, as long as we didn't go over the plants. Yes, exactly. Which um, which brings us to our next chapter in drone flying in Fukushima Prefecture. You're seeing, uh, Joe, you were not with us for the flight over the plant, were you? Oh, yes, I was. Uh, oh, da Daiichi? Oh, yeah. You okay, you were there. Okay, so. You know, you know that spot? That's where we put one of our sensors this last week. Well, it's, the, it's like, the, you know, being in the exclusion zone, you stick like, like a sore thumb no matter what. So this is like, there's a sit, this one underpass, which happens to be up, you know, on the rise above the plant. And it's a good, um, it's two kilometers at least to the plant, right? Yep. Actually, uh, 1,800 meters. Okay. So there's so a close boundary. But the farthest, when we were on the far side of the plant over the ocean, that was three kilometers from the transmitter which is technically, you know, right on the ratty edge of the drone, except we did have the advantage of elevation. So, right. and uh, so we, we flew, we, we set off. This is by, by the way, we had already done all of our tours for the, through the plant, all of our interviews. Uh, we, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble and lose the rest of the story. So this is the absolute last shot in the film. And so we went there and launched the drone and we got these shots. Oops, that's that's a fishing boat. Where did I do it? Hang on, I gotta find that shot, those the, the drone shots. Well, we'll talk, we can talk about Kashiwa Zaki Karawa later. Um, where is this? Hang on a sec. That's underneath the, uh, the power plant. That's in the control room. Yeah, What's that? Control. Yeah. All right, so hang on, I'll get you there. And so I, we, as far as I know, Okay, so this is what we got um, in the way of shots, and where, you're not seeing that anymore, are you? I've got it over here. Let yeah. me stop sharing screen here for a moment. Okay, so now you see. Okay, so see this. This is we flew right over the, um, right down, the drums. Yeah. I don't think we, we see. So we our drone is like we should have put a sensor on the drone. Why didn't we do that, Joe? Did you think about that? You must have thought about that. 
we did think of it, we had the sensor on another drone and we said we didn't have time to fly them both. Yeah. And the shot was more important. So I figured we, we did we did two or three flights. I can't recall, at least two, because I'd said, let's go do one quick one, grab the card, and then if we lose the drone, we lose the drone, you know, it's, it's uh, we lose, you know. We went, we, went, we went twice, Miles. We went in the evening, at, uh, just after sunset, and then you and I and Cameron got up at 3 a.m. Ah, uh, that's sunrise. right. Yeah, yeah. But it was so, as far as I know, I think right after that, they banned drones uh, in, um, over the uh, plants in a specific way. So we might've been the, uh, <laughs> we might've caused that little piece of trouble. Yes. But uh, Miles, Miles yes. Uh, a little bit later uh, in the morning here or a little bit late after this, we're gonna show some of the footage of, of, of things that Joe has shot with his drone. Not sure exactly when and what, we'll talk about it later, but we'll have some drone footage planned uh, a little bit later in the, in, in, in the event, so. Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it, when you think of the the value of uh, being able to uh, you know get over and you know when, when we on this trip this was one of our um, I think this was the trip we did in uh, February of twelve uh, Joe when we brought yeah that's the, it that's also uh, further south yeah um, then yep and but drones were drones are really just kind of you know just kind of happening and it was uh, very yeah very uh, edgy back then and very new. That's actually right. long. That was before you had the one that before we had the Inspire Two that Cameron brought. That oh, yeah, was the no, old no. These, uh, flame wheel that were, you had. These were kind of you know uh, back when you had to be you know a real maker. You remember this trip on the? Uh, uh, what was? Oh it? yeah. Yeah. To it catch the hell of it. One of the coldest. Out there fishing for fish they cannot sell just for the the, the purposes of. Uh, you remember, Miles? Fish. You wanted to go closer to the plants. And the uh, the owner of the boat was like, no, no, we're at the limit. And his son was totally on it. He was he was steering right. He wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's Diney. So we we spent a lot of time at Diney in this uh, simulator there, uh, where they you know they're practicing uh, various uh, emergency scenarios. Turned out to be fantastic B-roll for stuff. But everywhere we went, uh, we had you know this security guy, and uh, you know they they would they would check every shot literally every oh. shot it was just it was ridiculous and so um when it came time when we came back on the last uh, trip which was for the uh, the last documentary we did for nova uh we, we spent a huge amount of time negotiating with tepco trying to figure out um a sim more simplified way to do it and so we finally they said well you can shoot the plant as long as you don't shoot any of the entrances any of the fences or any of the security measures. So now imagine that for a moment. What does that leave? Nothing, right? There's nothing left to shoot, right? Zero. So we finally got them to agree to, uh, we, were, we were willing to, uh, and Nova went along with it, we would do a security review before we left the country with oh, their team to see what uh, oh, shots well, would be okay and what shots would be okay. Last week, just check. You guys okay? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The roads change. The roads change. We're in Tomioka, and the roads are different than they were a week ago. <laughs> anyway, so we spent a whole day in Tokyo at the end of this, going through each and every shot, putting blurs on them, and uh, which the, the security guys were like, you know, whatever, just do the blur. And, and, and then this is a pretty good place, actually. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, it, it was just just for show. Anyway, so um, I think that um, you guys. Uh, uh, I wish I could share that story, but uh, the uh, you guys have done some great work over the years, and it's just been really, as a reporter, it's been great to have. I mean, I you know so so much of what I did, so much of what I put on TV, literally could not happen without you guys. So uh, you know, you you've done. It's not just the data; it's the awareness and and the way you have helped uh, honest brokers of information tell the story, which is a great. You know, you should be so proud. Thanks. <laughs> and and you've been great for Safecast too. So it's been really, you know, great to work with you and have this long uh, communication relationship. So yeah. now Miles, we're at uh, at Tomioka, uh, where it's underneath where the drone basically was when we got accosted by when the first policeman showed up uh, and that led to, you know, 20 policemen uh, looking over our shoulders. Uh, and this, the area here, you wouldn't recognize it. 
all of the uh, the buildings that were damaged and the, the old train station has been completely demolished and rebuilt about 200 meters away, away from where it was. And uh, it's it's very difficult to even recognize the area here now. Oh yeah, that's so, Shakuhachi now. That's at Kashiwazaki Kariwa, uh, you and me at... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's when we were, we were on the other side of the, we went, uh, of course, TEPCO, I, I, you know, none, none of these plants are open. I, I, I checked, I think, what do you have, four or five reactors are, are operating at this point? Is that it? Yep. Yeah. So um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know what happened there, but, um, you know, they wanted to open up that KK plant. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, right? No, and at the time that we were doing those stories, the, the story of Daini was still sort of pending. They weren't sure if they were going to decommission it or operate it. Right. And yeah. uh, that's now been decided that they're going to completely decommission it. Yeah, this is uh, Masuda-san in, in, at Daini. Yeah, at that time, we were, you were, that was at the, uh, the spent fuel in the unit three at Daini. And the, fu the reactor was still fueled at that time. And look where we were, right That under, is in the, the control right rod actuation chamber inside the pedestal under unit three at Daini. Um, we had a, a 180 second time budget to film there. Um, and, and when our three minutes were up, it was, you, you were still shooting and people were saying, we gotta go, we gotta go. We wound up staying there six minutes, which was double our, you know, our dose allowance, but it was just so important and so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that's- the, um, uh, You remember the I mean, wall, the, the, the graffiti? Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Oh, you mean in the, in the control room? No, no, in there, in that chamber under the pedestal, the engineers had written, you know, little little markings to each other with with sharpies. You know, this uh, this motor has a sticky stepper motor. Uh, this one has a, you know, just yeah. little uh, like I like say technical graffiti to, from from generation to generation of the engineers for what's going on with the plant. It was that's the uh, kind of thing you don't see in the manuals or in the designs uh, when you look at these reactors. Well, you know, I, I still get kind of chills when I think about going into the uh, control room at uh, Daiichi. And um, we were there with the, the, the head operator who was there on that fateful afternoon and uh, right. who was an amazing guy. But seeing the pencil scrawlings on the green panels, you know, where they were right. trying to record levels, they, and, you know, obviously they, they were using flashlights. They were completely in the dark. All of them thought they were going to die. And, mm -hmm. um, and we had a brief interview with him, which was incredibly compelling, right? And um, he, um, it, we, we timed out and they, we had to leave. And uh, he was gracious and, you know, like so many people in Japan never said no. Uh, and we followed up with him. We said, we would love to sit down with you and do a proper interview at a later time when we can do this in a more relaxed way instead of being in these suits and uh, went through literally multiple negotiations, got all the way to the, the, the CEO of TEPCO and he, um, he refused to do it. And what, what, uh, it, it, it led me to an insight that I didn't fully appreciate, which all of you guys know very well, but in Japan, uh, there is a sense of individual responsibility, guilt and blame that we don't have in America. I mean, he is an individual felt deeply guilty, responsible, ashamed for what happened at Fukushima. And as, as I said to him, you know, to an American mind, that's crazy, right? You know, we, we don't think that way. And, uh, and I said, besides, there was nothing you did wrong. To the contrary, you were positively heroic, prepared to die there, literally, to save the plant as best you could, did everything you could. But he wouldn't even take that. He wouldn't even take that on board. And, and, and his neighbors shunned him. Uh, he lived very near the plant. It was it was just devastating to me to hear that um, that idea. In a way, it's it, it's very it's extremely honorable that every individual would take on that kind of corporate greater responsibility, but also completely unfair. Yeah, I disagree. Yep. Uh, I we have other people we know at Tepco who um, you know have experienced the same thing, experiencing that sense of regret and responsibility. And actually we have a, a video coming up before long with uh, Mr. Ishizaki, uh, whose job it was to go talk to the residents of Fukushima about their compensation payments. What do they need? What do they need? What do they want? And to basically be, to take a beating uh, on behalf of the company uh, because he felt personally guilty too. So this yeah. is something, you know, TEPCO has a lot wrong with it, but there are people who, who really want to 
try to make things better as well. So, um, and, and there is this consistent sense of responsibility and the, the, the notion that they can never make amends. But I would say probably there's a huge gap between the head office in Tokyo and their thinking and the thinking of the people who work for TEPCO here in Fukushima who are part of the communities. Yeah, a much great. greater responsibility. Well, Asmi, Asmi, we have a question here from Emmy. Can she come in? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so do you think, uh, Miles, do you think that uh, TEPCO has learned anything in the last 10 years? What, what do you no, say? It's funny because, you know, I went on my last trip, which was, you know, basically we did a lot of stuff right around the fifth anniversary. So it's been a while now. But I had the sense, you know, we uh, the, my entry point to TEPCO was through um, uh, uh, the, the Americans that were advising. Uh, Dale, uh, God, I'm forgetting Dale's last name. Joe, what's Dale's last name? The, the former nuclear NRC commissioner. Uh, Dale, um, it's not Dale uh, Evans. Dale, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. I don't anyway, think Dale Evans, but no. that was <laughs> not the Dale major. Evans. But anyway, <laughs> he, he and uh, I'll think of it in a bit. And um, Lake Barrett, who's a technical advisor, were, uh, and I believe they're still, I, I think, is that advisory board that they're a part of still in existence? You, we just lost you. I can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. Yes. Okay. I don't think there's any way to find out. I haven't, I don't have contacts inside. Anyway, the so people we knew in Tepper are gone. So I'm, Was it Dale, Dale Klein? Klein? Dale Klein. Dale Klein. Dale, that's Klein. Right. Dale yeah. Klein. So anyway, so Dale Klein was on, uh, along with some other uh, Western um, nuclear experts were on this advisory board and they were trying to push TEPCO to uh, communicate with the West uh, the likes of me. That's how I got, uh, you know, increased access as time went on. And so, um, I, you know, in interviewing the, the high-ranking officials from the sea level on down, Masuda-san, all these people, you know, they, they talked a very uh, strong game of being candid and forthcoming and having learned their lesson and listening to, um, you know, kind of the Western way of, of distributing information, et cetera. And, uh, but I, I never saw you know, you, you, you go to their website, you don't see much evidence of that. It's still the same dense data dumps, which are practically incomprehensible. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a history major who covers science, so I'm, I've already got a disadvantage, right? I'm, I'm kind of handicapped when it comes to my beat. But then TEPCO, they would say, well, we released the information, but it wasn't released ever in a useful way. And, uh, and they, you know, they were pushing very hard to get KK open. At that time, they were still pushing for Diney to come open. And, um, and they were also trying to lay the groundwork to release the water because, you know, it only contains tritium. And, and we come to find out in just recently that there's a lot more in there besides tritium and they've been holding out. They wouldn't let people go in and test it. The likes of you guys could have gone in and tested that and had an objective view of We've what's offered. in that water, right? And they never did. So uh, the, that's a long way of saying, I mean, I don't think they've learned their lesson which is a terrible thing to say after all this time and all the, the heartache and um, you know, the, the, the tragedy of, of that, that couple who lost their home and all the others, well, I think 40,000 displaced, I read the other day still, which is, you know, that, that each one of those is a tragedy like that, that couple that couldn't go back to their home. And to be so callous about it and not really understand why you communicate. And I realize, you know, some of this is just the way corporations operate the world over but there is a deep um, cultural um, bias against sharing information uh, in, in that society, I think, uh, which makes it even harder. And uh, so, um, so that's a long way of saying your, to your answer, no. Yeah, <laughs> it's like there's an allergy to transparency. Yes. It's like just yes. this fundamental institutional allergy to it. Um, they have to be pushed kicking and screaming. Uh, and then they will just do something, uh, you know, just for show to say, oh, we're being transparent, but it's not really transparent. Absolutely. We had a pretty significant earthquake. I guess it was deemed an aftershock from 10 years later, uh, just yeah. last month in February. And again, there were new cracks and, and the water levels were falling in the, the basements of the reactor at Daiichi. And the main message we got out was everything's fine. Don't worry, which is exactly the same pattern <laughs> from 10 it's years ago. Good. It's almost yeah. good. It's a direct quote, practically. Yeah. Well, so. They, the, the thing is, if they ever had a chance of releasing that water, I would say that ship has sailed, literally and figuratively. So now what they have to do 
because they, they better beef up those tanks because those tanks right. are going to be there for a long time and there's going to be more mm -hmm. earthquakes, right? Yeah. And they better be resistant, seismically resistant. And they're just going to have to keep, you know, sorcerer's apprentice style. They're going to have to keep mm -hmm. uh, building tanks and, and holding water there indefinitely, right? I mean, I, with, with right. the tritium and all the other witches brew in there, I mean, how many hundreds of years will that water be tainted? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's a long, long process. So, it's a good question. I, I yeah. Pardon me? I said it's a good question, right? Yeah. And and well, I mean, uh, and if, we'll, if, you know what we should do? We should push to go in there. I mean, has anybody yet independently measured it, or are the uh, the readings we've gotten so far based on TEPCO measurements? It's only TEPCO data and some from JAEA. They they measure some water with other uh, agencies and other organizations measure some of the water that's already released from the sub drains and from the bypass, but not from uh, th this storage area. And as you know, Dr. Bissler at Woods Hole, uh, Ken Bissler, you know, he's been pushing for this. We've been talking about this for years, literally, and they've been unable to get access. And we'll hear from, from him later uh, today talking about the same issue and what could be done or should be done with those tanks. But I think you're right. I think they should really investigate long-term storage. Uh, you know, at least for the half-life, tritium half-life is like 12 years, at least a few half-lives of the tritium, so that comes down. Uh, but it's it's just one problem generating another problem. Okay. Well, you, know, it's interesting. you know, the story is couched as the fishermen of Fukushima. And that that is obviously yeah. very relevant, very important. It's their livelihoods. But you know what? The whole world deserves to know what's in those tanks, right? The, the, this is our ocean. This is the Pacific Ocean. And there is a responsibility there that they're shirking, frankly. So when, when the travel restrictions ease up, I would love to come and try to push them to let us do independent uh, analysis of this water. Maybe we could do a story where we do our own analysis. That would be- Bring your, bring your own scientists, bring Ken. That, we'll bring Bissler, right. we'll bring Bissler yeah, over. Great idea. Do it. Great idea, great yeah. idea. Just, 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 just on, on that note, uh, Miles, uh, we, we have been in dialogue with, with TEPCO for, for some long time to get one of our monitors uh, you know, independently monitor at the plant, and you know, though we have had, you know, uh, you know, discussions that has never happened, and I think the independent monitoring is really a big deal in these in these accidents. Even you know, over the last year, ever, the whole planet has gone through COVID, and the first thing that went wrong is 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 data, no clarity, no measurements, uh, and all these things causing tremendous amount of confusion, damage, and. I think so. I think this independent monitoring of the water, the levels, the the, the things that were at the plant, still remains a big, you know, a, a big lack after after so many years. Um, I know that we're having a great discussion, but we're also looking at at our watch, and we have to kind of start to continue the program. Miles, uh, please hang, stay on the line, and we're going to have a few more things happening. So feel free to chip in. Uh, okay. And uh, we're now going to switch to the to the next uh, to 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 the next. Uh, 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 item on, on, on our program. And uh, I just wanted to repeat again for everybody who's watching, Safecast is a nonprofit organization. We solely are dependent on donations and grants. If you feel inspired, uh, do check out our donation page or go to our shop or check out the, the air note and, and find ways to participate in our project. Uh, this is only the first 10 years of hopefully what will be an eternal journey of, of citizens uh, coming together to measure uh, together. So, Miles, again, thank you so much. Uh, Asbi, I want to give the word back to you because I think sure. you're going to introduce us to the next guest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so uh, Miles, thank you so much. Thank you, thank Miles. You. Thank Thanks, you Miles. for inviting me and keep fighting the good fight, guys, and stay stay in touch, okay? All right. And, and no drive way. safely, Maras. Drive safely. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I change right. now? <laughs> right. See you, guys. Thank you, Miles. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay, so maybe I'll introduce um, the next uh, item. And, um, uh, you know, as we're, we're mentioning, you know, TEPCO is a strange company. Uh, they cause this terrible accident. Um, but there are people that we've met who, you know, are, are people that we can have a dialogue with as well. And one of them is uh, Mr. Yoshiki Ishizaki. And he has actually retired from TEPCO a couple of years ago. Um, and his job was um, to be the front person to go to, talk to Fukushima residents to uh, about their compensation payments, which of course, nobody was happy with it. They were so angry at him. And, uh, and he also was part of the community. He was living in Tomioka. He knew these people. And he talks about his experience of, you know, after the accident of, of, of having to confront the people that he was friends with 
who saw him as just you know part of this evil uh, you know organization that that causes terrible disaster. And uh, we um, you know I spoke with him uh, recently. We took a short uh, video of our interview uh, because you know he has left TEPCO and he has redoubled his efforts uh, to help the communities in in the way that he can. And I want to point out that he was instrumental in getting us access to Fukushima Daiichi, uh, where 10 of us made a trip uh, in late, I guess, 2018, uh, and were able to openly monitor uh, Fukushima Daiichi with our big eyes and put the data up. And uh, we have continued to talk to TEPCO to get permission to put a real-time monitor on site. Don't make a lot of progress with that. But I think we should hear from Mr. Ishizaki about his experience and his thinking of uh, you know, his own responsibility and what needs to happen uh, going forward. So can we run that video? Yeah, I think it's getting ready. Okay. Yep, just a little second. Yep. あの、お話を伺ったりですね。それから会社として<笑> たい変でしたかなと。うん。ま、一番大変だと思ったのは実は原発事故前にですね、福島第二原発の所長 3年 で、ちょうど 3月 それ今の仕事ほとんど復興関係とおっしゃいましたんですね。なかなら派でどういうことやってるかとかどういうふうになってほしいか。まずあの奈良浜町に住んでますけども奈良浜町で作った町づくり会社ってなんですね。で、そこの今
町をもう一度再生していくか復興していくか、うんまあ、そういう大きなテーマを学生の皆さんに自分の考えを話しまた学生の皆さんからいろいろ意見を聞くようなそういう授業をやってます、うんうん、で大きな課題ですよね本当にあのでじゃあうまくいけば10年後この福島浜鳥ならどういうふうに見えるでしょううまくいけば可能性はたくさんあると思ってるんですよね、うんうん、というのも福島この浜鳥特に海があって山があって川があって、うんうんうん、温泉もあるしゴルフ場もあるし、うんうん、すごくこう住みやすいと思うんですよもともとその自然の良さを生かしたでその自然の良さ地域の良さをいろんなところに発信をしてるんですね、うんうんでまずここにいる人がやっぱり明るく自由に楽しく生活をしてもらうと、うんうんうん、でそれを発信することであそんないいとこだったら俺も行ってみよう、うん、私も行ってみようと思えるようなエリアにする、うんうん、それはできると思ってます、はいはい、でも心配もあるじゃないですかただあのおっしゃるようにまだまだ人が帰ってこれないところもあるし、うん、そういう意味ではその明暗がすごくこの10年ではっきりしちゃったんですね、うんただその暗い部分はですねやっぱり少しでも明るくなるようにこれはもう国を挙げて、えー、しっかりと支援していくべきだと思いますけども、うんうん、少しずつ明るさを取り戻して、うん、こう自律的に動き出したところはですね、うん、やっぱり私も個人の立場でもいろいろできることがあると思ってるんで、うんまあ、でもそれ以上はできないんですけどもやっぱりこの地域で頑張ってる人と。コラボレーションしてですね、うん、あの活動していくのが私の役目だと思ってます、はい、ここの住民の心配とか占領とかそういう汚染とか精神とかまあ話よく出るんですか,かその話もあまりもう出ないんですかまあ私が今お付き合いしてる人たちは多分あのみんな思ってるんですけど口に出さない人が増えてきた感じはしますね、うんうんうん、ただ皆さんやっぱり心の底ではもう心配してるんだと思いますけども、うん、でもそういうのには私もその放射線の専門家じゃないんで答えられないんですよ、うん、放射さんでもないし答えられないんですけどもでもやっぱり一緒に私もこの地域でしっかりと元気に過ごしてる、うん、その姿を見てもらうのが、うんうんはい、まあ自分としても自分の役割の一つなのかなというふうに思ってますけどね。はいはい、分かりましたでもやっぱり福島の人ってなんか女性強いと思いますね、うん、特にね、うん、川内村によく行くんですけども、うんうん、川内村行きましたねいや行ってるまあそんなに知り合いはいないけど川内村で私がもう川内村を仕切ってるその女性陣がいるんですね、うんうん、川内村アマゾネス軍団って呼んでるどういうの呼んで<笑>あみんな怒らないのもう怒らないです全然仲良くしてもらってますし、何やってる人たち？いやもう本当におばちゃんですよ。うん、もう年も七十ぐらいの人ばっかりですけども、うんはい、いや強い強い。えー、で昔からみんな農家とかやってたとか、商売とかやってたとか、えー、もう商売やってる人、農家の人とかね。ねうん、やっぱりでも奈良浜町もそうだし富岡でも、うん、やっぱどの町村でもみんなやっぱり女性は元気だっていう感じしますね、うんうん、いやあるんでしょう元気は元気だけど協力して何かものを作るとか何かやるとかそれが大事じゃないですか、うんうん、で誰かリーダーシップ取れないとダメじゃないですか、うん、でそれがカリスマある人とかなぜそういう人が出てくるかって不思議、うん、っていうのはあの震災の前には多分全然知らないじゃないですかそういうことなったらあそういう能力はあるとだからどう,どうなるのこれからどうなるのかだから私見たらそういうお母さんの役割あるからもしかしたらそれで自然にできるかなと思っているけどでこれでお子育ち子供が育てる場所なるかならないかってで奈良派に子供が多いとおっしゃったでしょ今240人ぐらい、うん、他の町にまだないでしょですね少ないですね,ね、うん、でも例えば川内村なんかは子育て支援って一生懸命やってるんですよ、はい、あのシングルマザーの方なんか来たらね、はい、教育費無料ですよとか、うんまあ、いろんな支援をしたりして、うん、少しずつ増えてきてはいますけどね、うん、だからやっぱり行政として、うん、あの
、こう支援する制度をですね、うん、どこにお金を使うかって、その、箱物に作る、うんはい、まあ、10年でしたけども、これからはソフトに使う10年、20年、30年が来ると。はい、ソフトにできるから。いやそれが難しいでしょいや、難しいけど、それをやらなかったら、ダメだと思うんですよ、はいね。インフラとか、ハーとか、道路とか、堤防とか、そりゃ、あれだとやりやすいじゃないですか、システムあるから。そうです。で、そこに国もお金を出しやすいんです出しやすい。ソフトにはなかなか。人間に使えない。そうなんです。でも、その問題を解決するのは、うん、いつまでも国に頼っちゃダメだと思ってるんですね。うん、で、そういうのに気がついてる人たちは、やっぱり、自分たちの、うん、生活、運命は自分たちで決めるんだっていう、うん、そういう自立意識が少しずつ芽生えてきてるんですよ。うん、例えば、私がお付き合いしてる、ハマドリサーティーンっていう名刺を渡しましたけど、サーティーンの人たちは、双葉分で商売をやっていた、比較的若い世代なんですけども、うんうん、その人たちが原発事故でみんないわきに避難したと、はい。いわきで商売を始めさせてもらったと。うんでも被災12市町村の中にいわき市が、うん、お世話になっているいわき市が入ってないんで、うんうん、じゃあいわき市を入れて、雨どりサーティーンってして、雨、う、ど、ん、り全体を盛り上げるように、うん、みんなで頑張ろうって集まってる、うんはい、みんな商売、アンチョパニューアとか、そうです、みんな、新しいビジネスとか、この地域で商売、もともと商売やってた、はい、で町の商売というのは、農家とかいうことより、農家ではなくて、商業、ねうん、商業ね、どっちかって商業、工業。うんうんうん建設業とか、うんうん、そういう人たちがやっぱりいつまでも国に頼っちゃいけないんで自分たちでこの地域を作っていこう、はい、その時にいわき市も入れて、うん、みんなで連携をして浜通り全体を良くしていこうよっていう自立意識が出た、うん、その組織が浜通りサーティングなるほどまだ NPO とか法人まだなってないとこれから法人にする予定ですけど、ねね、そういう意味での高等教育機関というのは、うんうんやっぱりまだ少ない、足りないっていう実態はあると思います、ね、足りないでしょ、大学で教えられないところが多いでしょ、うん、だから、それでどう,どうしましょうか、どういう教育。今後、多分必要なのは、うん、あの廃炉に関わる技術者、うんはい、今は東京に本社がある大手のメーカーが、はいはいうん、東京電力から、うん、受注をしてですね、うんうんうん、それで下請けの仕事として少しずつ地元の企業を使うようになってますけども、うんうん、でもまだまだそれは不十分なんですねやっぱり地元の技術レベルも上げないと本当の意味での共存共有できないんで、うんはい、そういう意味での高等教育機関は必要だと思うんですね、まあ、職業訓練校的な学校、うん、それがハンフォードにあるんですねあるんですかねえ、はい、ハンフォードにコロンビアベースンカレッジっていうのは、はいはい、それは地元の企業がお金を寄付して、うんうんうん、で地元の自治体と一緒に作って、うんうん、でそこの CBC っていう略称で言いますけども、うんうん、そこで学ぶと必ずハンフォードで働ける、うんうん、で高い給料にもらえる。うんうんうんだからそのもちろんその地域に住むっていう条件がついててですね、うん、だからそれがうまくこう回転してですね、うんうんうん、いやーこれはまあ一つのビジョンがあるんですよ確かやっぱりこれから、まあ、特に廃炉とかそういう問題に対してやっぱり責任感が持っているローカルにたちがそれができれば一番いいですよ、うん、まあここで、うんまあ、大,大手企業の場合は、まあ、お金儲けていることは一番じゃないですかで目的違うから多分結果も違うじゃないですかと、うん、でこれはじゃあどうなるか課題が大きい今本当に直近で必要なのは、うん、もうおせっかいじいさんだと思ってます、はいはい、やっぱりそれなりの経験があって、はいまあ、定年になっちゃったけども、はいおまあ、この地域が好きだから住んでね、はいはいはい、で若い人たちがこれからやっていこうという時にそのつなぎ役とか、はい、コーディネーター役っていうか、うん、ファシリテーターっていうか、うんまあ、そういう存在が必要なんじゃないかと、うん、今の時代ね、うん、そ,れがでそれをやろうと今やろうとしてるねおせっかいじいさんですかそういう感じ自ら今年から俺はおせっかいじいさんになるよってみんなに宣言してるんですよ、はいはいはい、でいろんなところにも顔出して口出して、はい、そっちの、まあ、モデルになるわけねいろんな人知ってるんで、はい
あの例えば相談を受けた時に、はい、あそういう話だったらこの人にちょっと紹介してあげようかとか、はいはい、こっちの話だったらこの人紹介しようとかね、はいはいはい、そういうことはやってますですねネットワークネットワーク関係の、ね、自分は何もできないんだけども<笑>人だけこう紹介することはできるんでそれはどういう能力ですかなぜその能力があるんですかあ能力じゃないですそれは今までの経験から、ねはいはい、あの培ったその人脈ですよねあとにかくご縁、うん、一度いただいたご縁、ねうん、ご縁は一生っていうのはずっと自分のポリシーだった、うんうんはいはい、だからちょっとでも関係が気づけたらそれをずっと細長くつないでいくことをずっとやってきたんですね会社生活41年でそれでふっと気が付いたら結構な人知ってるんでその中で,で、ね、それが大事ねまあ、確か能力と思ってないらしいだけど私はそれは能力だと思います人間らしい基本的な社会的な能力だと思いますねじゃあとにかくやっぱり会って話よかったでこれからいやずっとこの連絡続きたいと思いますねでどうなるかってご縁は一生ですから、ね、そうですね<笑>、はい、ちょっと本当にありがとうございましたありがとうございました Maybe the battery is out. And、uh, I believe、um, it muted. So... Oh, you have, to, you have to unmute, Auntie? So the battery has to go. You have to mute. The battery will keep to run dead. The speaker is the new battery is over. I think this is hitting the power button. Hello? Oh, it's also an inside camera. Turn the other one.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. But they're not ready for this yet. They want to do rich Zajax things. I don't know. I can't really see. <laughs> Azmi, can you hear us? Or... Yes, I hear you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we, we had a small little uh, 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 we were a mute moment. Yeah, yeah so we we're, you know, batteries are dead. You know, specifically, my batteries were dead. Yours okay.、Too? Okay. Yeah, we're back. So, so where are you, Azmi? We are now in、um, the town of in Okuma. And、uh, we are、uh, very close to the entrance to the exclusion zone. And we are meeting here now. I will, I will sit back a little bit and, and flip the camera around、uh, mm-hmm. with、um, our colleagues,、uh, Shuzo Sasaki and Karin Taira,、uh, who、um, will, will soon enter into the exclusion zone with our B Gaigi and will be showing us、uh, some of the things that are happening there in the exclusion zone. Uh, including up to Sunlight Okuma, where we have a, a, one of our real time sensors.、Uh, and、uh, you know, they will enter, they have permission, they'll enter and drive around for a while and,、uh, and talk. And then、uh, we will meet up with them afterwards. And here is the、uh, B Gaigi cast, is now here on the car. So they will be streaming the radiation data from the, from the car as they go through Okuma. Sasaki san, Taira san, konnichiwa, o h a y o g o z a i m a s Konnichiwa. Yoroshiko o n e g a i s h i m a s よろしくね。そう。そう、どうしますか彼ら、it will take them a few minutes to get in, etc. So I'm not sure what you want to do in the interim. So, Osby, just, just to be clear, the program right now is, is to talk to Rich. Okay. So we need to、okay. do that first. There, so I'm not so, sure what so, you want to do, but Rich is lined so, up. So over the coming、yeah. 15 minutes or so, we have a chat with Emmy, Rich, and Joe. Great. Okay, and great. Then, so, 
So I will just give the camera back over to Joe and uh, and let him uh, talk to Rich. Okay? Oh, okay. You do that? Hang on. So, uh, may I, uh, may I join? So, Hang on. Let me turn this around. This is Richard's right there. Right? So uh, Richard is waiting online. Uh, let me introduce Richard Dejak. Uh, he is based in San Francisco and he was in. Here. In Japan in 2011 uh, to film documentary about uh, Fukushima. It's called the Hibakusha, and I, I believe it, it came out in 2012. Um, when he was here in Japan, I interviewed him uh, as part of a TBS uh, news program. And I, I, I went up to Fukushima with Richard and Michael, who's uh, filming here today. And we we'll welcome Richard. Thank you. Hello. How are you guys? Hi. Uh, hey, Rich. Long time. It's been a while. How are you, Joe? Good. Peter, how's it going? <laughs> Wonderful. It's great. It's, it's going very one. well. Yes. So. Okay. Can you see us or? Can you see us, Richard? Perfect. So thank you so much for having me on today. It's. <laughs> To see so many familiar faces. Yes, and uh, it's been a long also, time. So we have on we have on the line here. We are with uh, Joe. Uh, you know, in in Fukushima, we also have. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember Watanabe Norio. He's in Koryama. Yeah, you interviewed him in in Fukushima. Yes, and his kids. Yes, the high school uh, students. One of the high school students gave me a one piece t-shirt in San Francisco. So in honor of this, I'm wearing a one piece now. That's great. And we, we, wanted, we wanted to show a little bit of the video you made uh, at that time. So if you're cool, we'll bring that in. Of course. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> when you're younger, well, yeah. you're still young, but <laughs> high school. Almost half the age. <laughs> yes. I remember that day. Yeah. Was there supposed to be audio? Yeah. Is it there? Do you want? I, I, I think we're okay. It's just, I'll just hold it in. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for showing that clip. It brings back so many memories for me. Yeah, that was a uh, one of the early trips where we met people. If you remember, uh, we were you were shooting your documentary, and we were on a uh, kind of a washed out bridge at the, at the coast. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I do. You handle that. Yeah. Okay. Just a second. We have to talk to. もう、もうすぐ出ますけれども。じゃ、あの、ご会長さんのそういううちなので、あの、we uh, we, we lost the sound on this, so uh, so just a just a moment. Are we can so, do a play or 
We're gonna no. I think we we, we couldn't get the sound right. So let's just continue the discussion, Amy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, Richard, uh, can you tell me what you're doing now and your experience with Safecast? What you re remember? Yes, of course. So I was 17 years old when I first met you guys, Joe, Emmy, and Peter, and all. It was quite an experience. I am now 27 years old, and I'm trying to help save the planet through alternative energy like solar. And one of the things that I researched in my documentary was the idea of hibakusha. And I'm interested in hearing how that has progressed. Can anyone share that with me? Um, Richard, can you go on talking? Yes, of course. So the yeah. idea of hibakusha, bomb affected people or radiation affected people, is a word that came into being after World War II. Uh, and it can you go Sorry? Yeah, it's okay. Go on, please. A word that's been, that's been used since World War II to describe people with radiation poisoning, and it's being described again for the people of Fukushima, and it's very worrisome for them and for me because I don't know what the future is going to be in light of this disaster. Okay, um, and I actually didn't see your documentary in the end. Uh, how, how was it? Did I'm it... waiting to finish it. I'm still okay. want, to, I want to hear how it is 10 years on. Okay, so well, you're gonna come back here and keep filming and complete? That's the plan. I yeah. can't wait to see you guys. <laughs> yes, we, we have Good. we have what another son on the line. Norio, you want to say something to Rich? Can you go? What what another son? Can you hear? Hi. Ah, ah. 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 Ah, 海外からリチャード君が来てくれるってことですごく、なんだろう、海外の人もすごく興味を持ってくれてるんだなってことですごく、なんだろうな、話していて、自分の中でも振り返りができて、とってもいい経験になりました。で、海外であのアメリカに高
I think I associate more with the you know atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki rather than Fukushima, but um, I think uh, Watanabe-san, what do you think about Hibakusha? Do you do you think there is a you know still the stigma that like if you hear the word, mm -hmm. it's referred to the people in Fukushima? あの、<clears throat> so he's saying that the the title of the movie was quite impactful, but you know he doesn't feel um, it's referred to the, the people in Fukushima. That's helpful to know because you know the title is not final, but I'm interested to know how the society is progressing. So thank you for sharing. あの、ま、あの、社会 so he's saying the young generations uh you know have little memories and yeah. for more adult generations there are two types of people one who forget to forget one form who remembers still mm. so it's yeah yeah wow that's very powerful so for me, this entire experience has enlightened me to how SafeCast can help save the planet, not just in Fukushima, but even air quality. The things SafeCast is doing always impresses me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ano, Watanabe san, nani ka no Richard ni shitsumon toka arimasu ka? Junen mae to ima to awarete, junen buri ni awarete. えっと、リチャード君質問、えっと、ごめんなさい、あんまり関係ないかと思うんですけど、聞こえ。えっと、そのリチャード君がその so Watanabe san is asking you question uh that um he's inspired that you know someone who is the same age as you or is him is making a film documentary and he wants to know what you think about you know Fukushima after it's even you know 10 years I'm not afraid. I love Fukushima. The people are amazing and the food is delicious. And I think Fukushima will recover. It will take time. There will be some places that will not be safe for a long, long time, but there will also be some places that will be safe. I'm sure Joe and Ashby can tell you all about that. あの、福島の人にすごく良くしてもらって福島のことを愛してますと。で、復興には時間かかるかと思いますけれども、あの、時間かかるプロセスだけれども、きっと良くなると思っています。という風に言ってます。You welcome. Who had been impacted by the tornado in Joplin, Missouri, that it it completely demolished a hospital, mm -hmm. and then the Fukushima Daiichi to mm -hmm. hear about the experiences and to hear that conversation 
imagine people my own age 10 years ago, I don't think anyone had done that. That was very powerful. Mm. Um, あのリチャードはもともとミズーリ州出身なんですけどあのその福島での一番のよく思い出があったのがそのミズーリ州が竜巻がよく来るんですけど竜巻の被害を受けた町の高校生と,、えー、と福島第一原発の近くの福島の高校生との間にスカイプをしたという思い出があって、まあ、それがすごくあの印象に残っていると他にこういうことやった人いないんじゃないかっていうふうに言ってます。ですね。So, Richard, when are you planning on coming back to Japan? <laughs> I got my vaccine, so as soon as they let me. Okay. So, you, you already have or you're waiting? I already have, yes. You already have? Wow, that's really early. Wow. I, I, I live in a small town. Hey, Rich, thank, yes. thank you so much. It's really been fantastic to see you. And, and to hear you, and I, I think it was fantastic, Watanabe, and everybody remembers all the things we had together. So, uh, you know, it, it brings back a tremendous amount of memories. And, and thank you for being with us. Please stay on and stay on the on you know in the Zoom call and and participate and and hang out with all of us today. I want to go back to uh, to Asby in the car, and he is going to uh, you know talk about. You know the, the zone, and then we'll go into the zone. And as we over to you. Hi, thanks. here we are. Yes, uh, thanks, Rich. It's good to hear from you, and uh, thanks, Watanabe san. Um, so, uh, Sasaki san, do you hear us? Sasaki san, are you are you there? Is Sasaki san linked? Oh, yes, I'm now okay. on. Great, Konnichiwa. Ano, doko, doko desu ka? Uh, in the interim storage area. Okay, so Sasaki-san uh, and, and Karin-san are now in the uh, exclusionary zone. And this is uh, a place called the interim storage area, which is a, a, a massive landfill and processing for all of that uh, decontamination waste, mainly soil. They're making huge landfills. This entire, entire valleys are being filled with the soil, this contaminated soil, and there's uh, processing facilities for it. Uh, places where there were villages and farms and people living is now inaccessible and for at least 30 years will be closed off uh, as landfill for this waste. So, Sasaki san, uh, I'm asking him what kind of route he wants to take today through the exclusion zone. Uh, we are now driving uh, around the the soil storage places, and uh, we are heading to the uh, Sunlight Okuma. It's nursing home for the elderly in Okuma, and the SafeCast device is uh, placed, placed there. Yes, that's great. Yeah, I'll explain. Um, yeah, Sunlight Okuma is, uh, it was an elderly home on a hillside. And uh, I guess three years ago, Sasaki-san took us there, and the, we, there was a beautiful view of Fukushima Daiichi, just like less than two kilometers away. And we said, "Do you think we can put a sensor here, or ha what? Do, who do we have to talk to?" And uh, ultimately, we were able to do that. And, and one of our first, um, uh, it was, it's it's the um, SolarCast Nano radiation sensors uh, was placed there and has been sending data for for years. So, uh, yeah, now you'll go up there, right? So, um, Sasaki-san, how often do you come to this uh, exclusion area? Um, not so frequent. Yeah. Is this because of yep. the corona coronavirus. Yeah, it's hard to get permission to enter, right? And coronavirus has made it even harder. But every day, how many trucks are coming every day bringing the soil, the contaminated okay. soil? Uh, 2,000 trucks. 2,000 uh, trucks yes. every day? Yeah, every day. Amazing. So 2,000 truck drivers are coming in, uh, bringing the soil. Oh, here's the, the marker for Sunlight Okuma. We're going up the road. Um, 2,000 trucks of soil. And, uh, and yet it, it's hard for journalists and others to get access now because of new restrictions due to coronavirus. Yeah. So... Um, Sunlight Okuma, 
they evacuated very early, right? Because it's so close to uh, Fukushima Daiichi, right? Yes, it's uh, two kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. So they got some of the first um, uh, evacuation orders, right? Maybe within 10 hours? Oh, evacuate order? Yeah. Was issued at, I think it was at the night of March 11th in two kilometer radius. Yeah. yeah. So they were all put on buses and, and cars and were taken. But, but these people, everyone survived, right? And many other nursing homes, uh, many people died, correct? Because of the, they, they were, uh, had intensive care, but everyone survived from this nursing home. Yes, 90, pe 90 patients were here. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and all, the, all of them survived. Uh, that's great. That's great. So I see you're driving up to the parking lot, not far from uh, where the sensor is, right? Uh, yes. Now we are in the parking lot. Parking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and let's see how it goes when we go up to the, um, yeah, there's the fence line there. It's so rainy, it's hard to see. Do you think we can see Fukushima Daiichi? Uh, it's... Yes, great thoughts. Maybe you can oh, see okay. several uh, water tanks from here. Okay, okay. Will you get out of the car in the rain? Oh, okay. <laughs> and there's this big platform built for showing people. Here we are coming up to the fence. Uh, here's the fence and uh, is our sensor there? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, sure. can you take a look at it? The rain's really heavy. Really heavy. Is it possible to see the sensor? Yeah. Oh, okay. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Solar cast nano, safe cast. Hooray. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ask me, ask me yes. Mrs. Ray, is that the same? Is that? That's the same there, one. Been, Over three no, years. No, Over three really years, sending much. data constantly. Yeah. I am, I am, I must say, I'm truly impressed. I mean, I. I <laughs> <laughs> We're impressed, Ray. It's a great design. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that happened uh, when they built that platform, there was a sudden step down in the levels from that sensor. And we didn't know why for a while. And what happened to us when they built that, they, I guess they decontaminated around that area. So there was you know, a gradual decline. And then on January 15th of this year, a sudden step down of about 30%. Yeah, yeah. They, they cleaned up to make this viewing platform for, for guests. This environment ministry now will bring tours here to show them the interim storage facility, et cetera. So um, and we're lucky we got access today. We didn't think we'd be able to get access today. Um, so yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing piece of work. There's the device still sending data. Um, we, we would need to go check it to make sure it's not got water in it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So Saki-san, can we see Fukushima? Can we see, see the from there? Can, can we see it? The uh, it's hard to see. It's, can you recognize but... some uh, several hundreds of blue water tanks over there? Yeah, you can see the tanks. It's hard to see because of the you rain. Can see several towers. That's a uh, venting towers of yes. the unit. Yes, yes, and we can see all that. You can see four reactors from here. Yeah. Number one, number two, number three, and number four from here. Yeah, you can see everything. It's a beautiful, and beautiful view in a way. And this valley, when we first came, was still, it was abandoned, but it was still farm fields and the trees village, and houses. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Yes, yeah. yeah, still the abandoned farmland and some um, old houses were there, but now all gone. And yeah. to become the 30 year, another interim storage area. Yeah, so all 30 the years. Top soil will be stored in this area for another 40 years until 2045. Yeah. And the it's entire a... volume of the soil would be around 40 million cubic meters. It's so much. It's yes, so much. It's right? so much. Unbelievable. And this Unbelievable. will be it'll be a no entry zone for 30, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So this area will be shut down for another 30 years, but late yeah. after that, the government uh, plans to they give it back to the Fukushima prefecture after 30 years. 
right. Mm -hmm. so then, that's why with this area is the 30 year storage area. Right. What do you and Sasaki-san think? Will people ever live here again? Uh, after 30 years, I think yeah. uh, pe people can be back, I think. Yeah, yeah. But the, the population will be very small. Yes, I think you're right. I remember, Sasaki-san, you introduced us to someone whose house was down there. He was a uh, part of the city government of Okuma, uh -huh. and his family was there for 400 years. Ah, and he, yes. And he had to leave, and he gave his house to the environment ministry. Uh, Mr. Suzuki. Yes. Uh, under his fam, uh, the, his family lived here for 100 years, but last mm -hmm. year he finally saw the his property to the Japanese government. Yeah, it's unbelievable to me. I just can't believe that. And he he didn't seem upset. He said, yeah, it, it yes. it's the right thing to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, unbelievable. Well, um, I think maybe soon we'll start some music, I think, and uh, maybe have some music while you're driving around a little bit. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Uh, yes, that's okay. Are you so, so we will continue to drive around here. Okay, that's great. During thank the you. music session. Thank yes. you so much. Th thank, thank you so much, Osby. Uh, we're, we're about to cut over, but uh, so if you guys can go on mute, uh, Sazaki-san and, and Osby, you guys go on mute. Um. No, I spot like this. I got it. You got it spot like this? Yes. On the music? On the music. No, yeah. <laughs> this is the music. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> remove spotlight on the. Okay, I'm gonna add the spotlight here. No, remove spotlight. And then and spotlight on the car. Spotlight on the car. Focus on my own car. <laughs> And then don't spotlight uh, Osby and, uh, oh. and these guys. No, no, just. He's fine to talk about language.
I'm not going to take it. Hello. Hello, Asbi. Uh, so yeah. thank you, everybody. Uh, Asbi, just one moment. Uh, just wanted that was, to, that was yeah, really beautiful. Yeah, that was wonderful. That was just fantastic uh, yeah. combination of, of what it looks today and and, uh, and 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 with the musical completely, com you know, yeah. improvised, yeah. you know, by uh, Bruce Hepner and Andy Bevan, who are here yeah. in our building on the 10th floor. Uh, I would like to bring back to you, Asbi, and, and Joe. Sure. I think we're about to and and we'll say maybe say goodbye to uh, Sasaki-san and Karin. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Sasaki-san and Karin. That was beautiful. Um, for, for people who don't know, they were the scenery um, has been at a fish hatchery right on the edge of the ocean that was totally destroyed by the tsunami and then radioactive fallout. Um, it's literally right next to Fukushima Daiichi, but it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, this is a wonderful thing. I hear I hear the live stream playing. I think the audio. Are you playing the live Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Karine. I think that was from your your phone. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so it was beautiful, and uh, as they're driving away, and uh, we're here at Ono Station. Uh, west side. On the west side of Ono Station. Mm -hmm. So what do you want us to do? <laughs> so, so Asmi, I, I heard that you were about to install a sensor, or you already did that? Uh, we are thinking to do that. So All right. I'm here with Kurokawa uh, Sensei Sounds right now. We just joined us, and if you guys want to do that, we can observe you do that, and we can start sure. working. Sure, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so let me let me introduce uh, Kurokawa Sensei. Uh, he, he's a national. He's a professor emeritus at the National Gra <laughs> Graduate Institute. <laughs> Actually, the the scenery is still is still from the fish hatchery. The the camera I think needs to be switched. I think. Okay. Is yes, um, oh, I will continue. And um, he's uh, also the professor emeritus at the University of Tokyo. He's a medical doctor, and he used to teach at the UCLA. And um, he served the chair of Fukushima Nuclear Accident Independent Investigation Committee for the National uh, Diet of Japan. And he's also the president. He used to serve as the president of the Science Council of Japan. Right. Well. Too many titles, huh? <laughs> <laughs> many many titles to Crazy. Sorry, I have to look Crazy. Crazy. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Kuroka Sensei, can you tell us about how you get in, started getting involved with SafeCast? Well, SafeCast? Yes. Uh, I guess uh, because I, I have a long time friend with Joy Ito. Mm -hmm. So, that, that was the thing, I guess. Okay. And you're starting doing this thing and also Fukushima issues. And uh, that is the beginning mm -hmm. of our relation. Yeah. Um, so I, you're you're serving as a chair of the Fukushima nuclear accident uh, right. mm -hmm. independent committee and also supporting SafeCast at the same time. How <laughs> how was this it, Yeah, how was it possible and what was your experience like? I guess I think I think when this start, Fukushima started, I think I, I you know everybody just follow follow what the Japanese government is stating and a message, and also you can follow what is. Uh, all the press and some of the uh, sort of Twitter's emails from abroad and some experts where we, I have some friends. And obviously there's a disparity of the information given by the government officials and to the, also some of the message from outside with the many nuclear experts. So I begin to see the quite dichotomy of this message, which is misleading sometimes. So I began to work with a pushing Japanese government to develop an independent commission by the parliament or outside of government. Uh, so that I started doing it. it was under, so that's the beginning. Yeah. Actually, I just want to jump yeah. for a moment. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side of the screen is Joe. Yeah. Oh, and, right. Uh, you know, while we're talking, he's going to install the new uh, oh, so. air monitor sensor that we uh, ah, that we're working on with Ryozi for the last 
that's for a year or two or awesome. so. Awesome, that's great. And he's going to install it, and we'll, we'll catch up later with them. We're going to talk to them, but it's yeah. not to mention that it's happening. Wow, right that's now. nice. As we're, we're watching, and it will show how easy it is to actually deploy oh. an air sensor, the, you know, uh, 10 years on, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. That's and nice. So much effort yeah. to get that simple step going. Right. But now, it, you know, uh, we can see it, you know, it will take minutes, you know, for anybody to do it. So we'll just let that happen. And back to you, Remy. Thank you. Okay, so you, we talked about your serving as the committee <laughs> of the independent investigation right. uh, for the nuclear accident, uh, Fukushima nuclear accident. Uh, can you tell us about any like key lessons? From well, I guess I think that is the reason I started pushing government and other stakeholders in Japan, because we really have to develop some independent investigation task force anyway, international task force that I insisted. And later on, I think after some, some months, nothing happened at that time. I even I went to see Kansan, which was the prime minister and vice prime minister at that, at that time, Fukuyama-san. Um, but finally, then all of a sudden, I was uh, informed by Shiozaki-san. And uh, I went to diet, diet and they just they decided to have build this thing. And uh, because I was reasonably sort of uh, saying this kind of independent one, uh, so that I think with that news, maybe I'll be asked to serve one of the committee member. But at that time, all the things, there's some, some collusion or something in this f funny thing happening in Japanese institution, mm -hmm. you know, big government and TEPCO, all the things. So sufficient evidence suggests it's a very risky business for me <laughs> to accept it, right? <laughs> uh, so that I, I was a bit scared. But when I asked to buy the diet, I think I, they insisted I, I would be the chairman. So I, 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 I told them just I had to give it thought because there's a certain danger, potential danger. Uh, but, one, but I think they insisted, I think you have to accept it, otherwise everything will burn up, burn up. So, so I, I started to do it. But I think the principle of that, that committee I think first time just with these 10 members, I just, first thing I did is just went to Fukushima to see the place. Otherwise, nobody would trust us anyway. So how to run it is another issue. So the principle for me was this entire meeting would be completely open online and with English simultaneous translation so that you can share and everybody can follow this thing. So, so I, I remember meeting you yeah. at that time. Yeah, right. uh, you were writing the report, yeah. and uh, you know, Marai Sensei, who will be talking uh, after this, yeah. and Peter, you have to go and see. And you said, "Yeah, I want to meet you." And <laughs> I uh, and and I met you before, but I never really, you know, right. uh, I never really had you know been in, you know called for inquiring to the diet, and I went to the diet, yeah, I saw. and I brought the Geiger counter in a right, yellow, right. big yellow case, and there was a lot of security, and yeah. they, you know, I had, and somebody said, yeah, please give us this, this suitcase, and I so, gave it to the person, and then I went to the metal detector, right, and, the, and the suitcases went past it, they never, they never did the <laughs> And then I went to your office, and then we, we met, and we talked about what we were doing. I about. see. Because at that time, I also, I, I get a phone call from Joy mm -hmm. in Boston, and he was worried about the house in Chiba. Okay. <laughs> Can you find that? That was a... All right. The machine guy? Yeah. Then safe cast, eh? So oh. that was the beginning. Are, who Mr. is it? Oh, that's you. No. Is some Italian island or something? Oh, okay, we're still alive? Yeah, we're good. Okay, we're good. So we had a oh, so. Okay. security event happened. Uh, so, went uh, the lock <laughs> so, so, that's so that's the beginning yeah. with Peter. Then, yeah, everybody can see is, is, you know, we're doing our ultimate best to be as good as the professionals are. <laughs> So welcome to Safecast. Right. <laughs> ah, it's much better, right. <laughs> well, the citizen broadcasting and it's called YouTube and hey, there's Joe. And oh, 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 so that, yeah. So this is working and he, I think he has his home center right now somewhere in, 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 a, in, a, in a, somewhere. And uh, uh, that's happening, so that's cool. Uh, so, 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 Ellie, it's back to you again. And okay. Uh, um, so you, 
Kokasin, so you said there is, you, you felt like there was something going on in the government for dealing with the nuclear accident back then. Um, right. What do you see now, the government? How is it dealing with COVID? After 10 years? Feel, or? Yeah, after 10 <laughs> after years. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah, after 10 years, what do you think? How do you evaluate that? Uh, because I cannot say, I think, how the general public perceives is there any significant change after mm -hmm. this? In electric sort of power and also nuclear thing, mm. so this is a really the voices of not by me, but I think the general public is a very important element. And then I think role of media is coming in. So that is a sort of <laughs> sort of I have to say this is Japan. Mm. <laughs> Everybody's very quiet, yeah. right? So that is a. One thing I have been really thinking about these days, why Japan is just like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> even after Fukushima, which is a global disaster, right? Yeah. There's more than about 400 nuclear plants in operation in the world, and 50 in Japan, and not much voices and action. Mm -hmm. So that's so my conclusion always, always say, this is Japan, <laughs> sadly or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> We, we talked in the past about yeah. the, the concept of sontaku. Right, right. <laughs> you got into the Webster direct uh, the dictionary. Sontaku is, is kind of the trying to predict what the management is going right. to decide and right. acting already in, in favor of it so that the management will just follow their, right. their Somehow. advice. And in a way, it kind of has no, there's no real leadership, but it moves in, 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 you know, in, in, in kind of a in, in fizzy way. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so Japanese. Management has been <laughs> famous for that for some, for some in some circles. I wanted to to mm. uh, you, you're also today very much involved in in what is happening in terms of how we're reacting to the COVID uh, challenge. And right. Mm. So ten years ago, when I experienced Fukushima, it was the uncertainty and 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 fear for the unknown that really mm. was the biggest stress factor. In in a way, you know, mm, right. even in Tokyo, we had fallout. Right. And the fear for yes. Yeah, you know, the fear for your family and right. for your health was very real, and we couldn't see it or smell it. Right. And and but that was an experience I think that happened in Japan and in Fukushima. Everybody went through that kind of invisible threat <laughs> right. Uh, experience. Right. And and I went through that. Yeah. And, and a, lo a lot of trust was lost because of that. Right. And even today, after ten years, a lot of people still right. feel that the trust is not not restored. Right. But that experience was really for the people in Fukushima and mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. And from outside the outside world, mm -hmm. it was how that happened in Japan. But then COVID came last year. <laughs> and again, it's a threat that is invisible. You don't know what it is. But now the whole world got that similar experience. Mm -hmm. okay, so now everybody I talked to, they said, well, you know, that's what, you know, that, that's what we went through. So from, from your perspective, how do you see <laughs> The lessons from Fukushima and the lessons we're seeing in COVID now. What what is your impression? Are we learning, or are we are we making the same mistakes in terms of information, or are we getting getting better at it, or is the technology going to help us more, or are we still big gaps in that? That is a big big question. In fact, I think I share with you. So that is the reason. More recently, more and more, I sort of try to study why Japan has been just like that way. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many hypotheses, or at least if you read when Japan opened up, Iwakura Shisetsudan, you know, what they see and what they implemented in Japan, and that has been very successful in Meiji time, mm -hmm. independent, right? And then going to Pacific War. And then after this World War II, Japan was again very successful in economic terms, mm -hmm. right? So how how I think all the th all the things happened again and same thing repeated in a major issue. So that has been my question. Mm -hmm. So I start reading more like my building mindset in Japan, historical perspective, all the thing is one of my issue right now. So I I quite often talk about it mm -hmm. in the in the public or some uh, academics too. So that is another same factor which is falling science research output in Japan. You know, this earlier this year, I think Nature's uh, the university ranking all the thing uh, and the science output, Japan was number nine. And why is that? And top is a different area of top is com competition between US and China. Mm. But number two, three is Germany, France, 
and the UK, right? Which is a less population than Japan. So that is one of the questions I, I wrote about it too. So why is it? So that's my question. So that is the same background and mindset category, all Japanese. So how this kind of mindset has been built in the past? That's my inquiry most of the time, which is hard to understand. Right. <laughs> Particularly non-Japanese like you came from sort of modern time of democratic sort of nation. Maybe we can go to Asbi for a moment. Yeah, sure. How is it? Yes. Hi. Hi, um, how are you? Good, Sensei. Good to see you. I'm going to get my camera set. Yeah, so you were here at Ono Station. Um, so uh, as maybe you saw, uh, Joe successfully installed the uh, air note. Um, sure, it took a, we had to wait a little while because there was some some people around. We wanted to wait until it was less people, but uh, really it was very fast. I think you saw that. And Sasaki-san, uh, they've stopped their video, I think. They're on their way to Ono Station as well, so you can maybe... Um, take focus off their video but uh sensei um this whole issue of uh, government response and information mm -hmm. um you know th the ability of a government to give the right information mm -hmm. to the public is so important and we were so surprised to see when coronavirus happened that the same mistakes were being made again and again Right, like Fukushima, and not just Japan, and other parts of the world too. Yeah. So, do um, you think it's mainly a Japan problem, or is this just a tendency of government? Oh. You know is what I mean? A question? Is that a question? Yes, asking my thought. <laughs> I guess so, you know, I guess because so. I think this, this is a human nature, whatever the sort of your position in your country or community, as you go up the ladder, whatever, you, you have a big responsibility, bigger responsibility, like yeah. prime minister perhaps is a largest responsibility to the nation, largest number of people. But I think this is a human nature. When you fail something, mm -hmm. you have to hide it. <laughs> That's a human nature, right? But collectively, this is a matter of governance of institution because we cannot function effectively as a person on, because you have to have some institution or some group and the group, the top of this group has to be more triangle, right? So this could be a chancellor, president or chairman or prime minister, whatever have you, that, and president of a university. My recent question is, when this top person, the performance may not be good enough in changing global world, how you can get rid of this person? Mm. It's a matter of governance, right? And just take an example, just think about corporation, you know, public company, right? And even public company, is there any way to just measure, because there's a stock price and all the things, you can metrically, metrics can tell you whether this person, this institution is doing well or not, right? Is there any way to get rid of this person? That is outside world. That is implemented just recently in Japan. How about university? The chancellor. If this chancellor's performance is not good enough, what do you do? And I think over the last maybe two, three decades, most the chancellor of any university in the world, because this is more global world, I admire at least my best bet, my, my uh, Richard Rabin of Yale, who served as a chancellor for 20 years. So when I say this, many sort of Japanese economists go, what? But that means there's some mechanism to monitor his performance and then just, just why don't you just prolong another two years? And that is the reason. So I think that kind of governance of institution is fairly lacking in Japan. That's my argument. Mm -hmm. So Richard Rebin, great. I mean, so he served at 20 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you think there is a lack of like a performance? Or governance, or governance, governance of whatever yeah. metric yeah. may be. And can I, can I also ask, so it's, it's a question of leadership. You're highlighting the question of leadership. And I think in a crisis like we saw with Fukushima or in coronavirus, 
Um, it looks like, and we wrote about, I wrote about this earlier, um, leadership's important, uh, trust is important, right. but also the capacity. Does the country have the capacity to respond? And my feeling about Japan lately has been governance, the, the leaders often try to conceal the lack of capacity. They, they think, oh, we are not prepared, we don't have capacity, but we have to conceal that. So we'll just say, we'll figure it out later, we'll do something, we'll do something, and then we're in a situation now where I might not get a vaccine until one year from now. Right. right. No, that is the reason, I think at this time, how to govern this institution or whatever that is, I think this hyper-connected world, digital world, you just cannot hide it. If you hide it, once it's exposed one way or another, you lose the trust. So I think transparency is a foundation of trust in this world. And you just cannot hide it even beyond the national borders. So that's my argument, right? So that yeah, is the reason. It's yeah. true. But so that's why, why is that so difficult for leaders, governance, um, institutions to understand? Why that, is, is it so hard to be transparent? No, that is a mindset, you know, just quote unquote mindset. That's a sort of Japanese perception. No, so I, I, I tell you, just you know that because you are non Japanese, but spend some time in Japan, try to understand it. And so, so that your value, your, your perception is okay. But if you talk about this thing in Japanese, sort of established corporate and this and that, you, can you persuade them? This is a sort of mindset in categorically. So that mindset become a keyword in these days because that's a norm for majority of Japanese. So I think you, you begin to understand Japan and look some, something might look a bit odd, but that is quite natural in the human being. I, I just wanted to add yeah. to that point. And what, what I observed in COVID is, is that, you know, every, there's different management styles, there are right. different governments right. and there are different right. results. Right. Right, so, 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 well, well, I think that the Daiichi problem shows yeah. right. big weaknesses in the Japanese governance model. COVID showed a lot of weaknesses in a lot of other countries' governance model. I think right. Japan actually did very well, and you're being supporting right. that. Though there were a lot of challenges in the beginning with information, etc. If you look at if you look at the statistics now, Japan and Asian countries have shown much more resilience in dealing with a disaster like this than others. So. It's very hard to say what is good or bad, but, right. there's, but there's always a room for opportunity for improvement. <laughs> right. But I think in this connected world, and many people just following Corona, you know, COVID, right? Because this is a pandemic. So I'm, I'm telling Japanese government and also leaders, now it's fortunately or unfortunately, it's maybe started in China, but it spread out right away to the world. It's a bit become pandemic and you can, you can follow what leaders of each nation are telling to their people, you can also just what kind of uh, things they are doing individually, and that you can follow this thing, and you pick up a better one anyway. So, and then do you know what happened since COVID? And what is the cause of this each day or each month? And for example, US, or since COVID, you know, the, the cause of major cause of death is you know, coronary heart disease and all the things. And top is corona, COVID. All right. UK top is corona. Did you know that? And France is again top of the last perhaps one year cause of death is COVID. Japan very low, maybe twentieth. And Korea is also about twentieth. And Philippines about middle tenth. And how about then? So that may be Asian to Caucasian. But Australia, again, very low. Why is it? So that's a very interesting observation. And Philippines is around 10th in the middle. I, I'm, I'm from Bangladesh, should, yeah. as you know. And in Europe, it's all connected small countries. <laughs> so, but the response can be dramatically different just crossing the border. It's, right. it's, it's, it's phenomenal having the same problem happening across the world, having so many different reactions, really shows governance culture, you know, no, that's all right. the things we're talking about do have a huge impact on how we react to something like that, even though it, the threat is the same, the reactions are very different. I thought, and that's what I learned as well in right. Fukushima disaster is it's not just about, about, about you know, the, the, the physical thing that happened. It has a lot to do how we as humans are reacting right. to things and deal with 
with tragedies and stuff like that. So. And Corona is, and also Fukushima was the same issue, was uh, you are afraid of something invisible, virus or radioactivity, right? So that is the weakness of Japan, in my view. So I think, uh, let's see, oh, somebody in Washington Post wrote about thing. somehow Japanese response quite similar to Fukushima report by me. I think Taiwan, you know, they, they were good at responding yes. because they right. experienced SARS in, you know, like 10 years right. ago, and they apply it really quickly. This and time. also Vietnam, so, also about 20 years, yeah. very small, yeah. and Taiwan, very small, and Thai, and to, Thai too, very low. Yeah. So Japan could also, you know, if, 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 if the government and learned lessons from Fukushima, they could apply it to COVID currently, but I, I guess it's not but what you're what you are worried about is something invisible right, right. virus yeah. and radi radiation in the same sense right, right. it's invisible in a way. so it, they could apply some <laughs> lessons if they have identified if they acknowledge some lessons learned then they could apply it yeah to the current world so but, uh, so i think that is the reason any data science or the thing you can follow this thing and particularly like COVID. And that become pandemic. So you can follow what each country is doing, at least the first few months. Most impressive speech to the people of your nation was American son. Right? So everybody knew that. So why don't you do that? But I think that kind of thing, big people begin to see the difference. So that is the reason I'm telling the bureaucrats and saying, just follow all the country and maybe try to make some you know, copy certain thing, it's not a disgrace because this is a pandemic and just share this issue. What is the best, better one? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's why, you know, safe group like SafeCast having right. open data really right, is, right. has a really good impact. Right, right. You know. I just wanted to add one, one thing, put a couple of sense right. on, on the way talking about, you know, Usby's question was very right. important. I think even today, up mm. to 10 years, you know, also with Murai Sensei, who's going to join right. us later, open data and sharing. <laughs> right. and people, so I feel that we have not made a lot of progress in the mm. world. Right. Uh, for me, COVID showed that the control over information mm -hmm. still seems to be the way how we control the public opinion. And I think in Japan, I see the similar things. People are afraid, actually, to see the real data. Mm -hmm. like what we're doing today, all we're doing is measuring, driving around, talking to people, etc. You rarely see that on Japanese TV or worldwide TV. Mm -hmm. The opinions are cast before the measurements are taken. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and, and I, I think in one of the learnings I have is, is that, that, you know, the other way around sounds so logical. We first measure and then mm -hmm. we form our opinions. Right. And, you know, as you have, you know, led a very long and, 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 and exciting life of doing tremendous amount of things, if you look forward and you say the next generation, well, how, how, how would we start to become more open and how do we take that fear away of the of the data and how do we say well, how, let's face it and right. what you know how do we get there no i think that is the reason in this hyper connected digital world hiding certain thing is a failure because once it's this this sort of exposed to a bit greater public and all of a sudden you lose the credibility and re rebuilding this credibility is a very hard thing to do and because that's a part of your culture, right? So national border, particularly in Europe, I see just national border is just, you know, just line, invisible line. But in island nation may be much better protected because of Australia, you know, COVID is pretty low and Philippines is in the middle, but, but still like Thailand and uh, Vietnam, very low. And why is it? I'd like to know. I think there's going to be many PhDs yeah. minted out of the COVID. <laughs> so, so that is the reason I think both are invisible, but this go beyond national border. Mm. And so I think this is a great question. So just show the data. And I think there's a lot of questions. Mm. And I like to know. So everybody want to know. So that is always a mindset, not mind. This is a principle of scientific research because you want to know right you you try yeah. to inquire mm -hmm. why is it so that is the principle of scientific research okay so um as we do you have any comments no you know <laughs> we've we've been talking with 
you know, right. Kurokawa Sensei for so many years, uh, okay. and he's he really is so perceptive about so many things, and also talks to people at a very high level in government and organizations, and is a very Kurokawa Sensei support for us has been very important uh, mm -hmm. because of, of of his networking, etc. Um, but Sensei, you know, you have been talking about this, trying to see changes for almost your entire career. <laughs> And you're not a young man anymore. <laughs> you don't have to say how old you are. But, but yeah, but changing a mindset of sort of, for example, it, it very difficult. You know, how, how Italian thinks on French or this and that, that, that is very hard. That's a sort of, uh, not a sort of national, national or education or whatever you do. And that's a part of a heritage. And at least when you are doing very reasonably well in economics or something, and then your, your people be reasonably happy. So I think this mindset is hard to change because you are nurtured, because this is a very unique community here because your background is different, education system is different. How, what are the sort of priority? Now that is the reason when I go to UK and this and that, I argue everybody want to copy at least sort of modern democratic society, which is based on the Europe, right? Uh, but France, you know, they, there's no royal family. Why is that? So that's a sort of question I raise, because then that is the reason French scholar was very much interested in American democracy, because America was built by sort of somebody left their own country, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And build without royal family. Right. So, 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 so we, we, we got some comments on, on, on sure. YouTube, uh, through I our YouTube it. channel, and, and I think Emmy is going to look at them uh, right now. So uh, also, I, I, I know Junya Madeira, you're on the line, you're from Fukushima. If you want to right. add comment to this discussion, that would be great. Or, or uh, just, just chip in and switch on the camera if you're, if you're currently online. Uh, also, Watanabe-san is there from, from Koryama. If, if any of you want to add to the discussion, it's really about you know, how, how we work as societies and what we have learned right. and, and where we can do better. Uh, uh, did you find the comments, uh, Emi? Yep. Um, I'm not sure if that's So there is a comment, maybe um, Jap Japan is being the Japanese gov governance is being like a, a sontaku, might be a little <laughs> too much. That's their comment. Uh, why sontaku? The reason, is, you know, no, no, I know that, but I, I, I usually pose the question, you know, once you graduate, let's say college, you know, super better, best college or better college, go to Hitachi, mm -hmm. right? Engineer, whatever you do. After 10 years in Hitachi man, can he move to Sumitomo? No, no, right? No. So how about let's say go to law school and get into somewhere, banker, right? Mitsubishi Bank, working 15 years. He's a great sort of person, a banker. Can he move to Mitsubishi Bank to Sumitomo Bank? Are there any country, reasonable country, who you just cannot do it? Just Japan, mm. so this is Japan, you know? So that means you cannot move laterally with a banker. So I think if you go to somewhere like the Davos meeting or the thing, mm -hmm. you know, meet people, just shake hand, and what do you do? And they usually say, I'm a banker. So I ask them, what kind of bank you are there? And you're here and there, and you can see what kind of whatever he might be. But in Japan, you introduce well, who you mm -hmm. are. I'm a Mitsubishi bankman. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So that, that is conceived, perceived, as a norm in majority of Japanese. Mm -hmm. But because of under that system, Japan has remarked, achieved quite good sort of economic growth and become one of G8. So I think they think this is a norm. But in this global world with hyper-connected world, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. That's my argument. Mm -hmm. I see that Jim just came online. Jim, you want to check in the discussion? Or? So you cannot move. So you have to say yes mm. to your, your superior. If you always argue, argumentative, you lose. Mm. So that is the reason. That's the secret of India. Argumentative India. Mm. That's a good book by Amatya Sen, who is Indians, 
but become a chancellor of Cambridge, <laughs> right? Very smart man. So he writes argumentative Indian. So India always argue, and that is the foundation of democracy. はい。そのネクストコメントです。はい。昨日の問題とはですね、昨今の生活に対する動きと同様に市民はかなり反対や抵抗していますが、え、政府が全く反応しないというふうに見えます。市民としては、ボリンも同じです。Because you have to choose your representative politician. So that is another thing. Uh, because they are talking about two-party democracy, right? 10, 15 years ago. But somehow, in, in Japanese mindset, in general, do you see any two opposing sort of philosophical or political issue in your mind? So why is that? That is only one party then. Why is that? They're talking about two parties. So I always often just ask uh, sort of smart bureaucrats, are there any opposing perception among Japanese at large? Mm. So that you elect two, you choose two parties. If you don't think about it, then just you have one, one party. Mm. And that is the reason even corporate something happens, they go to Kasumigaseki asking advice of bureaucracy. Why is that? Usually you go to politician. Janai? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that has been my question. <laughs> so I think we're, we're about to wrap up. Do we have any other questions or anybody who wants to? Or the solution? What should I do? Should we can do as a sort of educational sector, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's Is I think Murai san invited me to the 20th anniversary of Chaos Shonan campus to welcome speech at entrance in, in, in the other country, they had a commencement speech, right? If you're invited to give a commencement speech, that's a great honor, mm -hmm. right? But in Japan, welcome speech when you enter. or friend is a great speech. Mm -hmm. That shows you something too. Mm -hmm. Once you're in, right. you can get out <laughs> four right. years later. So that is a quite different perception. Yeah. I also think if you look at history that big disasters are big learning moments right. for societies. Right. But, All the but, time. At, but, but at the same time, as we're going through some of the disasters with Fukushima, with right. COVID and mm -hmm. those other things that happen in other parts of the world, it's also in a way, you know, how big should the disaster be for us to actually change our habits? Right. And I, I you know, I don't I'm not asking for your answer on that. I just wanted to close <laughs> a little bit with that thought okay. because because Fukushima was that big shock for Japan, mm -hmm. but not much really changed. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so that brings the fear of do we need bigger impulse or do we need to, to change our, you know, to change our, the, you know, is our educational system or where, or where do we <laughs> right. bring the, do we need, you know, catastrophe to, to innovate or to do things differently mm -hmm. in a bigger scale and change our political systems or whatever. COVID brought us to some of that. But again, I think we're missing the opportunity to really say what went wrong here with this scooting over. Right. That's my personal opinion, but <laughs> but but I think there's lost opportunity in a way. I think I think that you know there's there's disasters are never nice. There's there's a lot right. of lot of pain, something else. Right. But something positive right. to come out right. of that I think right. is is human is the human opportunity is to re recoup okay. and, and and build. No, that is the reason I think why I. W I just, my key message at Shonan campus, where I something, or welcome speech, was, K was built by Fukuzai Yukichi, mm -hmm. which is a great man. And that's a fantastic show. But, but now you inherit your heritage. So what I'm suggesting then at that time was, take a leave while you're a college student, take a leave one year, go abroad somewhere, NGO, wandering around, or some MOU, some university, that's fine. But I think maybe you have to you have to speak some English and this and that. But most important thing is while you're a college student, you're an independent person. You are not belonging to any corporate or something, right? So that one year take a leave. Then what happens is you meet different people, all the things, and the magnitude of poverty, poverty is unthinkable in some part of India, all the things, and also Africa, whatever you could do. But common thing for you to 
become of aware of is Japan, because that's your country. So all of a sudden, this is quite different. But you begin to see good thing about Japan, which is very easy to do, even you are in Japan. But once you are abroad as an independent person, you begin to see the weakness of Japan. Relative weakness. That is nothing to do with intellectual capacity. Have it. So that's the reason I spent like 15 years or 14 years abroad. And that means you are out of the Japanese system. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to see the weakness of Japan, try to make it better. Mm -hmm. So that is a nurturing, healthier, patriotic, patriotic feeling, not a narrow nationalism. Mm -hmm. So yes. that is the reason you do it. And all of a sudden, Shonan campus, after 10 years, more than 20% of students go abroad somewhere. Mm -hmm. And there, Murai san and all the faculty are so excited about it. It's completely different, changing yes. the campus too. Yeah. Yes, so I told the same thing in Todai to welcome speech. I was invited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are not doing, but now small number is start doing it right now. Guru mm -hmm. Kamsa, thank you so much for coming today. Yeah. I would also like to thank you on behalf of Safecast and all our volunteers for <laughs> right, your right. relentless support always <laughs> yeah, and inspiring you. us to to be like you at your age is all our is all what we aspire <laughs> to be. And I'm not going to tell the audience how, your age because that's in, that's inappropriate, but. You are a great inspiration for many, many people, and <laughs> I would you. like to thank you for bringing that energy today again. And we're going to go to the next step, and I think, Emmy, you're, you're going to take over from here again for me. And Kurugawa, Hi. Please, please stay with us for, for moments. We're going to... Right, that's uh, fine. Uh, okay, so, so uh, the, you know, the, currently in Fukushima, we're, the camera's over a little bit right now. We just got in the news that there's extreme heavy rain right happening yeah. here, so they're kind of... Right, They're terrible. Taking, taking a break, but while we're having that, we're going to have uh, uh, you know we're going to have a video message from Professor Murai, yeah, who has uh, you know who would have loved to be here today. Great. So he had some other obligations that he took the effort ah, so, so. to share a message for for all of us. So thank you. I think uh, Kelsey, if we if we get ready, then we'll, in a moment we'll switch to that, and after that we will be back to you. With more, with more from Fukushima and from from uh, from here. Right. Marai Sensei is part is is the uh, the, uh, the dean of the SFC campus. He is also known as the father of the internet in Japan. Right. Uh, he built the internet in Japan. It's one of the best in the world. A lot of people uh, know him from his work there. Uh, he is also uh, a passionate, very passionate person about about right. uh, open data. Mm -hmm. and open society. Uh, right. He's currently the advisor to the Prime Minister of Japan to build the right. first digital ministry, right. which I think for Japan is a massive opportunity for change as well. Uh, he, I also know he's a very passionate about music, so I'm very sure that he will be watching this later just to check out all the musical performance we have throughout today. But okay. I think what's really important is, is we have worked with Professor Morai from day one for a little bit for context. I've been a researcher with KU University for the last 13 years. And I've been working and I've been blessed to have been working with him throughout those years in, in many different contexts. But we also work very closely with K University on the Safe Cost project. We did joint research, we did joint deployment. And we, uh, you know, we, we have many, you know, many things in, in terms of, of we share between his, his passions mm -hmm. and Safe Cost passions, I think, are very much aligned. Right. So, so okay. it's really a pleasure uh, that, you know, an honor for us to have him, uh, you know, have him with us today. So once Kelsey is, is, is ready to go. Then let's hey. cut over and let's let's uh, listen to Professor Murai. Thank you so much. Good. Thank, thank you. you. So much for coming thank, today. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, SafeCast community. Um, so uh, congratulations for the you know kind of celebrating or I don't know the. Um, Anyway, spending the time for uh, thinking about the 10th anniversary of a safe guest activity. So uh, this is very meaningful and very important. And I really appreciate the continuous uh, efforts on, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, activities of uh, safe guest. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the safe guest for the past 10 years uh, means a lot. And then it's still uh, meaning a lot for the future. Therefore, the, I'm sending this message. By the way, this is Jumrai, uh, KU University, and the wide project, and uh, uh, whatever I belong to. But uh, anyway, so 
I'd like to appreciate all the uh, uh, 10 years of activ activities of a safe cast community. Um, the first point, of course, about the safe cast uh, uh, activity is about the technology thing. So um, uh, the uh, 10 years ago, um, the of course, uh, you know that was. Uh, uh, I remember the it, you know the 2007 was uh, kind of uh, iPhone and the mobile, uh, you know, um, the smartphone and the other devices with a lot of uh, sensing uh, devices into the uh, single device and then also the uh, very. A uh, good uh, environment for the mob mobility as an infrastructure. Therefore, the uh, safe cast activities are based on that thing. And the background was uh, uh, of the earthquake was uh, uh, basically after uh, the establishment of the, that kind of environment for the mobile uh, networking uh, in Japan. And uh, therefore, the you know the device gonna be uh, connecting to the mobile network, and uh, then you know it's uh, basically the very uh, important challenges uh, utilizing the sensors in the mobility technology, and uh, then uh, collecting data and uh, doing a good thing uh, for the uh, society and the people by utilizing that digital uh, data. Uh, from the, you know, kind of grassroots activities and the people's activity, not from the top-down type of a thing. So, uh, which was uh, very much uh, amazingly uh, creating the harmonizing uh, impact for the, you know, the the Japanese government's efforts about the uh, radio impacts, radio effects. Uh, collection and uh, also the safe cast. So uh, uh, creating the harmony was also uh, the important thing. And uh, then, then of course the uh, IoT uh, has been discussed in the past 10 years in uh, many ways, but uh, uh, the, the safe cast activities uh, actually building uh, about the sensors, collection of the sensors, improving them continuously, and uh, then you know, also uh, discussing about the very much a scientific uh, understanding about the accuracy of the data, and uh, which was a very important activities and that should be learned uh, from the many of the other activities relating to the IoT, and uh, uh, also uh, you know mobile network. Uh, that was the uh, time of the, you know, starting of the, say, uh, 3.9 uh, generation. And uh, then uh, now uh, it's uh, 5G everywhere. And uh, then, well, not everywhere, actually. But uh, anyway, so the 5G is open up the, the new uh, environment for the mobile uh, connectivity thing. So which is also a very uh, important time in the past 10 years. So uh, uh, SafeCast living with uh, those uh, transition and the evolution of the technology, which is a very interesting time for the past 10 years. And uh, again, I really appreciate and uh, uh, celebrate and uh, congratulate that uh, Safe SafeCast uh, has been, you know, working on the past 10 years. And the, the second point is that the, this year, 2021, is uh, from Japan point of view, the, this is the open up of a new uh, development of a digital society in this country. So uh, I have been involved on a kind of a promoting and a proposing, actually, the, the uh, role of a digital society and how it's going to be established. I think uh, it, uh, it's been, you know, um, so far very successfully moving uh, toward the future. So uh, on the September 1st, uh, we're going to have a digital agent uh, agency finally uh, to uh, to uh, play the very important role inside the government structure. Very special head is a prime minister, and then working with all the ministries of this kind. Uh, this country, so uh, relating to the digital society. So, uh, and also uh, 20 years ago, I have been also involved uh, for the setting up the basic law for the defining the principle about this country is about the IT environment. And uh, 
it was the year 2000 and this year uh, 2021 and uh, uh, on the exact the same day as uh, September 1st we're going to cancel that uh, uh, basic law 20 years ago and then uh, we're going we're gonna to start the new uh, digital society establishing developing uh, a basic law as well so uh, these two laws among the other uh, actually the four other uh, laws relating to a digital society so so this is a very uh, important time in this country that uh, uh, we're going to think about the individual benefit of the digital technology and also the public use of a digital data and the including the privacy and the other thing and the, of course the infrastructure about the new um, uh, the mobile uh, coverage uh, including not only coverage of the residency but also the coverage uh, targeted toward 100 percent which is uh, covering the mountains uh, forestry and uh, farms and uh, uh, ocean that means, uh, you know, the different type of a target for the, all the sensors around the nation. So, which is, I hope, the uh, beneficial and the, then, you know, of course, opening up a new horizon for the safe guest activities as well. So, um, and the use of the digital data, safe guest, uh, told everybody around the world uh, what was the message? So that was the uh, ethical use of a digital data by, by uh, generating, generated by the citizens, people. So that, that, which is a very important thing. I really want to take that concept about safecast into the uh, design of a digital society in this country. So the now the third point about the, my message is about the future so the i just talked about the coverage of the internet uh, which is going to be very much a changing if you heard about the you know kind of low earth orbit which is uh, certainly the 100 percent coverage around the world so the people in this planet is going to be uh, reaching to the almost 100 percent in probably my expectation is like five years, 10 years uh, from now. So uh, uh, from here, I mean, the past 10 years and the beyond 10, uh, you know, future of 10 years, and uh, we are expecting all the people in this planet uh, has access to the internet very much. So uh, internet inclusion gonna be on a totally different stage in the coming 10 years. So uh, this is very important and also the uh, basic of the safe care, which is uh, resilience from the other uh, accident, mistake, or the uh, natural disaster, and the recovery from that, and then and how we learn from that kind of a historical incident. Uh, that type of uh, safe cast uh, policy and the safe cast concept is going to be a very, very important and also opening up a new uh, stages of the digital society and the digital infrastructure as well as the digital data. Uh, so uh, again, congratulations for the past 10 continuous activities of uh, SafeCast and I really want to see the uh, you know kind of next 10 years of the activities. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Uh, do we have to turn on the video? We'll turn on our video. Okay, can you see us? Yes. We're on Emuso now? Yes. Yep. Okay. How are you now? Okay, so um, we're here at uh, Ono Station. And I will flip the video around so we can see a bit of this, this scenario. This is a parking lot in front of the station. Um, here's a, a radiation monitoring post right here showing 0 0.3 microsieverts per hour. Up there on the window, you can't see it so well is the sensor that Joe just installed, the air note. Um, this 
is deep inside the exclusion zone. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, the government decided to establish something called SRRZ, Special Revitalization and Recovery Zones, which means decontaminating a small piece inside of the highly contaminated exclusion zone to enable people to come back. Um, but what they've done is sort of turned this into a, I mean, the station is open. Not many people use it. Um, and there's nothing around here. Uh, this is a pretty well-known ghost town uh, and has been covered in lots of media coming to the old Shoten guy. I'm walking forward to show you. So oh, there's a train you, coming once in a while? You, every hour or so. Every hour, okay. And uh, there's like a, a little shuttle bus that will come and take people, but nobody's living here. The station is open. Uh, but nobody's living here. And it's unclear when people will ever live here. It's really just a ghost town. And uh, I think we're gonna talk to Tom Gill. Is Tom Gill uh, connecting up now? Uh, yep. Um, hey, Tom, how are you? I'm okay, um, but I can't start my video. It says the host has disabled it. Oh, now it says- Okay, it's maybe the host will now, enable now your video. They're now they there you are, Tom. Okay. So, Hi by there. way of introduction, Tom Gill is a sociologist, lived in Japan a long time, uh, studying marginalized people, and spent a lot of time uh, in Fukushima, particularly in the Nagador area of Itate. And we got to know each other. And Tom, the other day, we had an interesting conversation, uh, which is why I wanted to talk today about this strange thing that happens with Japanese governance. And how did you put it? the difference between places and people. What was your observation about that? Okay, um, by the way, I'm strictly speaking an, a social anthropologist rather than a sociologist, but never mind. Okay. Uh, um, uh, so uh, my argument is that in, in Japan, we have a very strong um, uh, ideology that um, stresses the importance of the relationship between people and the land. Um, and uh, so uh, you're supposed to love your furusato, you know, furusato, your hometown, your home village. Um, if you say you don't love your hometown, it's a bit like saying you don't love your mother or you don't love Japan. It's the sort of thing that's, you, you, that's just uh, virtually impossible for most people to say. Uh, and uh, so what is uh, a furusato? Well, it's made up of a place, a certain place in which people live. And most of the time, um, uh, no, nobody even thinks about whether it's the place or the people that matter most because um, uh, they, the, the, the issue doesn't arise. However, the Fukushima nuclear disaster did turn that into an issue um, uh, because uh, places like Itate village with, that I've been studying for the last uh, decade became uh, uninhabitable uh, and um, the question naturally arose of um, uh, what should what should be done with the people and um, at the time there was a movement called the Shin Tenchi or Motomeru Kai the um, society for demanding a new homeland. And uh, th they launched a petition demanding that the government find some other piece of land, preferably in Fukushima prefecture, to create a new Itate village so that the community could survive in a different place. And they picked up about 600 signatures on that petition, uh, which um, uh, was, uh, uh, only about 10% of the population, Itasi village had a pre-disaster population of about 6,000. And that, uh, that option was never taken. Uh, and uh, instead, the mayor of Itate uh, uh, and many other um, people in positions of authority um, laid this really heavy stress that what Itate village means people living on this particular piece of land. But this particular piece of land was officially too radioactive to live in 
So what were they going to do? Well, they've spent a decade uh, and uh, many uh, trillions of yen on decontamination uh, and, uh, and 19 of the 20 sub-districts of Itase are now open for habitation again, but less than 20% of the population has returned and um, it's very unlikely that any more people uh, will return because after so many years, uh, they have got used to life in a totally different place. And so, uh, sad to say, um, Itase village has been preserved in the original place, but without nearly all the people due to a misplaced uh, emphasis on place rather than people. That's my basic argument. Well, that's well put. That's extremely well put. And I think we, we do see this uh, happening throughout uh, the, the Fukushima region, um, that it, it connects with what we heard from others, Mr. Ishizaki, about it's easy for the government to support the building of infrastructure, of buildings, of boxes, uh, but it's very difficult to support the soft infrastructure, the people, the education. And I think you really hit the nail on the head by highlighting this, this perception uh, that, you know, the government is responsible for a piece of ground. It's responsible mm. for a territory, a physical territory, not mm. so much responsible for the people, um, mm. along with the historical reasons mm. for that. But you know, Asby, um, uh, this has been very much the picture with the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But if we think about other examples, for example, what about the um, coastal communities that were devastated by the tsunami in other parts of Tohoku. Quite a lot of those communities have been rebuilt further inland or on the top of cliffs where before they were at the bottom of cliffs. Um, so, you know, it's not impossible to keep the people together while changing the location. And also Japan uh, notoriously has a colossal number of uh, dams. Uh, and when those dams were constructed, lots of villages and communities were flooded and they were paid compensation uh, and um, provided housing in other places. So uh, although this obsession with, with the connection between people and land is so strong, um, there are situations where it is overruled. Uh, why wasn't it overruled uh, in this case? Um, uh, I think a number of reasons um, uh, one is uh, local factors, the, the very strong insistence of local leaders on, uh, in, in my case, the mayor of Itata, who was completely obsessed with returning to the land. Um, he published a book uh, in which he, he promised that they return in two years. In fact, it ended up being six years. And in, and in the case of one district, um, it looks like it's gonna be 13 years. Um, and, um, and also there's a, a certain, um, a certain grayness about exactly how dangerous the radiation is. If your village is, is uh, flooded and it's under 20 meters of water, you know you're never going to live there again. Um, in the case of radiation, you know, there are lots of different opinions about what a safe or dangerous level is. Uh, maybe one day it might be possible to go back. And uh, I think that crept in and influenced the debate. Yes, uh, it's great. And uh, one, we have to understand and admit that this is an unprecedented situation. And there were no contingencies for this sort of for the situation. And as you point out for the uh, other parts of the Tohoku coast, Yes, it was not irradiated. It was theoretically possible for people to return if some infrastructure and repairs were made. Uh, whereas here, it was simply uh, not deemed possible. So the other side of this is when I've spoken to um, the government officials, for instance, connected with the town of Okuma and Ono Station is part of the city of Okuma, um, they seemed very sincere about mm. wanting to make it possible for people to return mm. uh, to places like Ono. And yet I don't see the capacity or the vision 
necessary to, to present any kind of attractive uh, or positive lifestyle in a place like this. Other parts of Fukushima, possibly. Uh, individual communities in many places we know have great vision, they're working very hard, they're doing great things. But I don't see uh, any, any real attempt at persuasion uh, of getting people to, to return. It's more like we had a punch list, uh, things we said we would do, we've done them, we've done our job, now it's up to you. So kind of throwing it back on uh, the, the populace. Um, and if I may, another factor related to that, Asby, is that, well, I agree with you that uh, local governments, uh, government officials, uh, uh, on the whole, they've been sincere. They've wanted to do their best for the people. Uh, and I'd even say that uh, with a few reservations of the national government, you know, the, um, the, you know they, they want to do the right thing. But what is the right thing? Um, and um, part of that attempt to, you know, expiate guilt and, and show that you really care, it has been compensation policy. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of the people uh, who are living in the contaminated, contaminated areas have received enough compensation money to make them pretty rich, yes. uh, rich enough to buy a, a new, a nice big new house in another part of the prefecture. Uh, and of course, uh, once you've done that, um, the... Uh, the um, urge to return to your tumble down farmhouse, uh, it, 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 you know, in a fairly remote part of the country, which may or may not have been sufficiently decontaminated. But even if it has, there's still lots of undecontaminated forests and mountains around it uh, gets weaker still. So yes. um, giving out the compensation uh, and um, uh, uh, and um, taking a very long time over the decontamination, put those two things together. And um, most of these communities um, will, uh, will die. They'll yes. die. People they, vote they with their feet and, and they vote with their feet and most have already made their decisions. So yeah, it's a very interesting situation. Um, you know, there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, and um, I guess, you know, if I were a Fukushima resident, which I'm not, and it's hard to, we shouldn't overgeneralize because people have many different opinions, but um, I do know that people love their hometowns, like you pointed out. Mm. They love mm. their hometowns, and this has been a wrenching experience. And, mm. and I think that people would hold on to the dream of being able to return at some point, even if now mm. they're, they're unwilling to or, or making roots elsewhere. Um, mm. Throws us back to, yeah, what is the responsibility of government in this situation, what is governance? So um, maybe if you have one last comment and then we can wrap this up, I think. Um, okay, um, well, okay, one last comment. Another reason why um, uh, people have been so reluctant to return even after the giant decontamination programs is because of uh, the fact that they don't trust the government they're told that, that it's safe to live there, um, but um, you know they've been lied to before. Uh, the government did lie on a number of famous occasions, especially er in the early days after the disaster. And um, uh, this may be a, a little controversial for some of your Safecast followers, but I would say they were also misled by the anti-nuclear lobby, which exaggerated the health risks of radiation. Um, re after 10 years, I think the verdict is in. There is no, not going to be a, a massive uh, increase in cancer, leukemia among the people of Fukushima. Um, and I blame um, the anti-nuclear lobby for failing to distinguish between two totally different things. One is nuclear power a good thing for Japan, where I would agree with them and say, definitely not. And two, is there gonna be a, a terrible health crisis in Fukushima? That's a totally different topic. And my, my answer to that is, was 10 years ago, still is, no, they're gonna be all right. Um, but uh, they, they're not gonna be harmed by radiation, but they have been harmed by stress, 
discrimination um, and um, a, a lot of other very um, harmful things that came along with the uh, exaggeration of the health risks from radiation. There, I said okay. my say. Well, you said it, and that's a very clear statement. I do know a lot of people who agree with you. I agree with you most, mostly. I would just say that at the time of the accident, there was so much we didn't know and didn't have the information about, and that lack of trust, as we know, still persists. So, um, well, thanks a lot, Tom, and I look forward to talking more and to hearing more about your work and reading your great uh, writing about it. So, I, okay, well, thank you very much for having yeah. me on. Thank you. By all means, stick around. Uh, I'm going to sort of flip the camera around here. Um, oops, oops, what did I do? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll say bye for now and I'll, I'll turn off the video. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Um, so, yes, I'll flip the camera around. Um, so here we are. Oops, sorry. This is the camera? Where's the camera flip? Yeah. There. There. So here is the uh, air note that Joe installed here in this absolutely empty, it's not a ghost station, it's like an unborn station here in Ono Station. You wanna go take a point at that, Joe? Um, yeah, and uh, 0 0.6. Um, but that, this is a, a, a PM 2.5 it's, it's, it's an air, radiation air quality sensor. meter. And this yep. is an air pollution sensor yeah. measuring a particular yeah. sensor in the air. This yeah. is our, our rollout of those yeah. devices. Yeah. So this is kind of the strange, you know, slightly dystopian reality uh, we have here in a place like Ono. And um, yeah, I don't know. How, how's you guys uh, in Tokyo, Peter and uh, Emmy? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, hello? I think you're on mute, Abdi. There you go. Uh, in the station, they have these very clear maps, you know, with lots of information about radiation levels. Uh, anyone who comes here is going to want to in Japanese and in English. And there's this very, very slickly produced map where you can come in the waiting room where nobody ever waits <laughs> uh, to a map to find out about radiation, current radiation amounts. Etc., and it'll have the map, and you can sort of zoom in and get the information from various, um, you know, radiation sensors. So, radiation is very, very on the forefront of, you know, the concerns uh, of the government and the railroad company when they uh, uh, rebuilt this station. So, there yeah, there is no one else besides you guys. Well, we see one or two people. Uh, earlier on, when Joe was, we were getting ready to put in the sensor, we saw some guards. <laughs> so we sort of waited. That's why we walked around for a long time. Uh, but we've seen one or two people coming to take the train. Um, but it's really, there's no staff at the station. It's a totally unmanned station. Uh, very, very beautiful, clean, you know, but it is really uh, a station without a purpose, I think. Uh, just like we see many parks without purposes and that kind of infrastructure work. Uh, without people. Okay. Thank you. And Asbi, I think you're going to uh, introduce Yoichi Kao-san. Yes. Yeah. So um, a moment ago, Tom Gill was talking about uh, Itate and uh, particularly the, the district of Nagadoro. And we have a, another very good colleague in Itate named Yoichi Tao. And he is actually a physicist uh, who uh, started a, an organization in Itate with farmers to help them learn about uh, radiation and how to remediate their fields, how to grow crops safely, if it would be possible. And they have about 40 farmers in the group, uh, a couple of scientists, including him, and they do great work. And it's not a big scale project. It's, it's about the people and coming together and spending the time to learn about measurement to, 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 to actually be out in the fields, you know, digging and getting dirty and, uh, and, and doing that firsthand as a, a hands-on learning experience. A very impressive person and a good sense of humor. And we uh, spent time with him recently to look at some of the agriculture projects they're doing, kind of experimental agriculture uh, and also a new community center that they built. So, um, you know, it's, it's very 
uh, for me, it's a kind of a visionary project. They believe that there is a future for their community, but it's not gonna be anything like what the past was like. So I think if you wanna roll the, the video there, and then Joe and I and Emu will head on to our next stop, which is right in front of Fukushima Daiichi. Okay, we'll see you after the video. Okay. Here in Itate with the Fukushima Saisei no Kai, which is a uh, restoration of Fukushima group. Uh, Professor Tao is one of the co founders, along with Linio san here. He's a farmer, and this is actually his farm, uh, which has now become an experimental farm and a place for testing and experimenting with agriculture. The Kokono Basho ga, ma, san di, chikara ko, jiken no noka to ka, so yu, saite no kake no jin. Ja, koko wa, nani arimasu shou ka, mawari ni kono shisetsu to ka. He has the, the office for the Saisei no Kai organization right here. And then there's a place they have uh, experimental uh, farm plots growing food. Uh, uh, it's actually a joint project with the university, uh, and they're gathering data, collecting data, and trying to do data uh, centered uh, new agriculture. And then based on uh, the, the, the products that they grow, the vegetables that they grow, uh, they have a kind of a small laboratory here, which has uh, radiation measurement equipment, very, very many kinds, which they use to uh, measure the results of the radiation content of the food that they're growing. So, of course, basically one of the, the main goals of it is to uh, start being able to produce food for the market again, but uh, what's happening here is really not just uh, about the market. Uh, they're starting to learn about measuring their own environment, measuring the things that are close to them, uh, and also uh, what they call uh, kokoro no care, which is really mental health and sort of you know, uh, mental psychological health care. So it's a, it's a very good place for people, local people, to come together to uh, work together to try to solve these problems. So, we'll go take a look inside this uh, vinyl greenhouse where they have an uh, experimental uh, drip agriculture system. え、Okay, so this is a, a place for, um, it's, a, it's a joint project with the university. Uh, the agriculture is really a sort of scientific based using technology, uh, sensors, etc., uh, to monitor, um, you know, temperature and water content uh, when uh, things like um, uh, fertilizer needs to be added and it's going to an automated system. And uh, they grew uh, cucumbers over the summer and now they've been growing spinach. So they were growing spinach, this was full of spinach, and there was actually several other greenhouses of the same size uh, growing spinach recently. And most of that has already been cut and harvested, and hanbaite mo utteru desu ka? And actually has been on sale, has been marketed. Uh, and there was some spinach left, but then just a few days ago they had uh, visitors. Do you okyak san deshita ka? Honbai wa sumiwaki wo shinai to dame nan desu ga, o saru san desu. 
They are monkeys. Local <laughs> monkeys came to get their green vegetables. Yeah. Uh, they're probably really, really, really good, Sony. あ、そうですね。基本的にこのシステムは成功してますね。はい。で、あの、ま、実際ね、え、ちょっとそこを見ていただければ分かるんですが。まずあの、栽培等にあたっては、このように土の中に、はい、っております。で、this is a あの、ま、現在ほうれん草ですので、ほうれん草に必要な養分がきちんとあるかないかを見ておりますこれ養分だけど、これPHですかえっと、pHですかえっと、pH じゃなくて、えっと、陰子と、うん。え、陰子ってい
the Fukushima disaster was that people were dispersed and, and the communities actually broke apart. People moved away, families were separated from each other. Uh, and a place like this, uh, they're seeing as an opportunity uh, to bring people back together, to physically, literally bring them back together. Yeah, and he was pointing out that, of course, Itate, like much of Japan, uh, there's a very aged population, lots of elderly people. So uh, they made a special place. It's an Irori, a Japanese fireplace, fire pit, uh, where elderly people can gather. So, the Irori, we'll take a look at the Irori, uh, where people sit around and have these very free and open conversations. Uh, is that? This is really big. This is a very big irori. And then go over the Yeah, yeah. We sit down here, and then uh, you hang like a pot down here. This is great. Uh, and uh, burning the wood here, and you can just have the heat. You can make tea. You can make fish sakana. Yeah, you can put fish on a stick and, and grill it and talk. Uh, and it is hake no ne. Yeah, and drink, while drinking and talking. And this is just a very traditional, ancient, very ancient community communications uh, situation for Japanese people. Um, mm. So what's with the, the black, there's a blackboard and some paintings and the clock. Um, these all came from an old school. So so the school was originally built in the 1880s and was literally next door to the location where we are now and the village decided to demolish it. There was a lot of opposition uh, but they had their their pragmatic reasons to do that, so they demolished it. But uh, Tao San and the rest of the Sai Senokai uh, salvaged a lot of old parts of the school, like uh, this old blackboard and the clock and some details and paintings and uh, lots of other elements. Yeah, so yeah. So the club あ、残りの saying that of course initially they they were thinking about the elderly people uh, which is of course most of the population uh, but lately a lot of younger people are coming and uh, Itate village the population before the disaster was about 6,000 and only about 20% have returned so far uh, which is not very much at all uh, but people do come back uh, have events spend time here uh, people the village office uh, people will come as well and sit around and uh, sit by the fire and drink and talk very openly it's a very good uh, communication situation for everybody これはこの村の中で今若い人が自分のふるさとで帰ってきたり勤めは役場とか限られてるけどある人たちは車で来てる車で帰んなきゃ飲めないこれは飲み屋がないそれでここが最適だ車で帰ってきたこれで止まればい
いやいや<笑>あそれでこのあおとといあ昨日やったあのフォーラムオンラインフォーラムで約150人ぐらいのアーティストやなんかこれからここの村がもしよくできよくなるんだったら移住したいとか戻っていきたいっていう若者たちもみんな話をオンラインでやった。So, yesterday, he, there was a big online forum、uh, related to the arts, and、uh, about 150 young, young artists,、uh, many of them said if,、uh, if they could, if the situation you know, became、uh, good for them, they want to move here. They really find Itachi to be a very attractive place. So, the 10 years ago, the image of 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 Uh, emerged regarding the situation of、uh, Itate village 10 years after the disaster.、Uh, Sai Sentan means uh, uh, most progressive village. Progressive. Most progressive village. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's great.、Uh, so, he's saying that the image of rural areas everywhere, not just Japan,、uh, is always sort of behind the times.、Uh, no one ever thinks of it as the most advanced. Uh, but because of the things that they're doing in order to、uh, get past and recover from、uh, the, the Fukushima disaster,、uh, this village is becoming、uh, a very advanced village. They want to make a place where not just Japanese, but people from all over the world would like to relocate. <laughs> I'm saying I would like to live here. I really, I really love Itachi Village. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>はい。And yeah, we'll ask about your experience、um, with SafeGas. And Kelsey. Kelsey is a chief community officer at Fab Cafe. And she's been based in Tokyo. She's originally from Florida, US. Okay. So, Nando, do you want to start、uh, your experience? How did you get to know SafeGas first? Yeah.、Um, the, 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 the first reason I actually got involved with SafeGas. Was、uh, the, the idea of、uh, community and、uh, the idea of citizen design science, specifically、um, the idea of、uh, making、uh, technology more accessible and more open?、Um, and uh, uh, coming from、uh, Zambia, where I was born in Southern Africa,、um, that train of thought is still quite new and evolving.、Mm -hmm. So,、um, and s a f e s has done some projects there. So, it was exciting to actually、uh, get a hands on experience.、Yeah. Okay. okay. How about you, Kelsey? How did you get involved with SafeCast? I think you've been with SafeCast since 2017. Yeah, so yeah. actually,、um, so I've been at Fab Cafe since 2017.、Uh, and you know, that's whenever I really got to know SafeCast well. But come to think of it, actually, the first time that I visited Japan nine years ago,、mm -hmm. the way that I found Fab Cafe and the way that I found SafeCast was through Sean Bonner, who is a colleague of my previous. Cafe boss. And so、oh, Sean said, you know, we set up the SafeCast office and they just opened this great cafe downstairs. Won't you come and, you know, talk to them about espresso and talk to them about coffee? And then that's actually how I <laughs> came to, to start working here. And then I found out about SafeCast and I was very passionate about their citizen science uh, mm -hmm. activities. Mm -hmm. And、um, yeah, I was interestingly attracted to all the work that they were doing. Right. And you are involved with the Mirai Camp at Mori Museum? Right.、Yeah. So,、uh, so over the summer,、mm -hmm. uh, the SafeCast team goes to Muraikan、uh, Summer Camp and、uh, helps a group of students put together a Keigaigi.、Mm -hmm. So, the Keigaigi is more of an educational tool, but they can actually take it out and measure the radiation around. And you'd actually be surprised. Some of the like, 
not concrete, but like a flooring mm -hmm. around this space is a little bit radioactive. So it's really fun to see the kids face light up when they can actually use the tool that they made themselves. Right. Okay. And I think you have your I mean, big I you made on your. Yeah, so this is the one that I made myself <laughs> and um, maybe I'll hand this to you. <laughs> so basically, uh, it was my first time doing soldering as well. Yeah. Um, so my first time like really dealing with hardware in general, and it was so much fun. <laughs> Actually, uh, Joe and I built it together. So right. I got to spend like a good day and a half with him learning about, okay. uh, you know, the mechanics of this guy. Okay. And we also created uh, a custom design yep. for the plates. So actually there's three plates, sorry, four plates, sorry, three plates here. Um, and some of them have to design on both sides. And the most magical moment is that after you get done putting it all together and then you flip the switch and then you, oh. <laughs> and then you turn it on and you see the safe test line go mm -hmm. on. And you're like, ah, it's working. Yeah. And then after some moments, you'll start hearing the clicking. I can hear it now. And you kind of feel like you're, you know, a member of this long line of people who yeah. have been making the and mm -hmm. feeling empowered by right. what they made themselves. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, by the way, this is a 10th anniversary uh, special edition of uh, Big IG. So uh, it's actually uh, designed by Ian Lynam, my one of my friends, uh, who is a graphic designer based in Tokyo. Thank you to Ian. He was not able to join today, but yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, and Nando, you have the one from actually this. We have several versions, and this is is this the one you actually made? Uh, this is not the specific no. one I okay. made. Okay. Um, my one's at home right now. Right. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, this. I, I got the chance to um, put it uh, together here um, in the office. Um, but I think the great thing about this was that um, when I got the chance to take it back home, mm -hmm. um, so I traveled to uh, Zambia, South Africa, and uh, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. um, getting some readings there. And the, the, the greatest thing was actually coming to contact and talking to people about it. Uh, we had a, a big discussion at that time, this was 2019, mm -hmm. about the nuclear industry in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to use a big gaigi um, as a as an entry point to talk to people and discuss the various um, topics around it was extremely amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's been a fun roller coaster right. uh, ride, uh, and it just keeps on getting better. Mm. What was the people's reaction there when they first saw it? Well, you know, how did you explain? <laughs> well, you, you know, the, I mean, in some places it was definitely great. Um, one story I do remember was that when I was in Ethiopia mm -hmm. at the airport, um, they actually <laughs> thought this was a bomb. And um, because at, at the time, Ethiopia's uh, main power sources uh, are either through uh, coal and hydro. Mm. So uh, explaining this to the um, police officers right. at the airport <laughs> took me a couple of hours. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> that was an experience. So okay. um, yeah, if you're ever flying for Bigagi, I, I recommend you have a, a good um, instruction manual just explaining <laughs> to the pictures what right. it actually does. But it's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, they were really interested in like how it works. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll probably say is that because everything could be um, built by yourself, it's really easy to actually explain to someone mm. what each part actually means. So mm. yeah. Okay. And you, uh, okay. And sorry, we have one more guest actually, uh, Rolf. Uh, he is an artist based in Nara and joining us now. Hi, Rolf, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, Rolf. Hello. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll continue and when Rob can hear us, he can join. Um, yeah, so you measured radiation in Zambia and Ethiopia, these two countries. And South, South, South Africa as well. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and did, what was your findings? Um, well, generally the, 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 the findings of Africa had been, uh, some of them had been picked up uh, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, fortunately, uh, I use quite a lot of public transportation, mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to just add additional information to that. In uh, Zambia, we had some uh, some good relationships in, in the past. Uh, this, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, is, do you hear me now? 
And this, what was your findings? Okay. Wow. So there are already people on the ground who's measured before you. Yes. Okay. It, it just wasn't that the information was up to date. Okay. And then, uh, the Ethiopia trip, I think, was uh, a bit more new. I don't think there were there weren't readings there. Uh, for okay. So you started the history there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's great. Okay. I think can you, Ralph? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, can great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So I heard that you made kegaigi. Uh, I did uh, many, many things, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, well, tell, me, tell us about your uh, SafeCast and yourself. How did you get involved in what you do? Yeah, we, um, me and my partner, we went, uh, we were living in Tokyo first, and then we know already Peter. And when the uh, tsunami and the earthquakes struck, we went the next day with journalists to the disaster zone. We had many troubles, but luckily Peter kept us an uh, update. So we could call in to Peter and to tell him what's going on with the nuclear power plant. And from that on, um, yeah, we started a kind of um, relation with uh, Safecast. Mm -hmm. And we continued that. And we stayed one and a half year in Fukushima in, um, in Aizu Wakamatsu, where we uh, built a uh, prototype of a data center. We Safecast came over there. We built uh, many, uh, I would call them Big at that time. And then later I got involved with the Big Nano development. And from that on, much more. And I can show you other things, like, for example, um, let me switch that. Let me check if that's possible. Okay. Switch my camera. Hold on a second. Not that easy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So we modif I modified Big IG nanos like this. <laughs> So we can have much more power. We can have much more possibilities to to transmit the data. Not only recording on the SD drive and upload the SD drive is here and upload it, but we could send it by Wi-Fi and BLE. So after that version, we made I can show you all different kind of versions. This test and then another test, and then finally we made this small board for the big Aiki cast that Joe is now using with us in Fukushima. Uh -huh. And from that part on, at the same time, kind of similar development, we started to do the big Aiki. Uh, that time it was not called even big Aiki, it was called integrated hardware or something like that. Just a simple board and people could buy it. And it had an, uh, and red beer processor and that processor unfortunately we couldn't get it anymore so we started to think about how to make it easier so peter came up with the idea for the big Aiki raku and the big Aiki sen it's basically a display with all the hardware built in and it fits on a prototype board this is the one of the first prototype we made then later we came to this version of the board it's a much simpler board the only it can be put together in 15 minutes and it's hardly any components and a little bit level up it's this version and finally we came up last week with a board like this and it's easy to solder and easy to make and peter will show you later uh, versions i Oh, wait, I have one here too. This is the new prototype. Dance it, dance it, dance it. it will come, uh, I mean, it should should be. This is the, yeah. Big Aiki Zen. Big Aiki Zen, yeah. Peter yeah. showed it, and this is the working one. The one Peter has okay. is still in progress. Yeah, that's it's, uh, it's very simple. Yeah. But simple. also this one, the big advantage is you don't need an external um, 
how would yeah. you say that uh, it's upload simpler. it can upload by itself mm. right. and the registration is very easy you click the bottom on the top and you see a qr code and the qr code goes automatically to the data of the sensors mm -hmm. this most of this work uh, the software is done by uh, robin robin snyder he did a lot of work on it let's see okay it's a very simple machine and it's a very easy to assemble and um, peter should, should probably explain a little bit more what we're going to do with it so how, how, how would you comparing to uh big ig how easy it, is it like how, how long would it take for people to make maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes maximum 10 15 minutes yes yeah. this, this whole thing <laughs> really <Yeah>. wow <laughs> how, how long did you take to make one for yourself well it depends <laughs> all the well, times i, I miss bolded stuff right you started from the soldering lesson right yeah, so it yeah. took you like i think that like four hours four hours is, mm. you know if you're going well making yeah. progress yeah four hours is about right. yeah okay so that's how it's easy to make this one wow yeah. That's great. And it's also probably going to be much cheaper and the parts are much updated it and because the, the some of the parts is hard to get and the suppliers they um, for example other fruit they keep changing the, the model so we have to modify the boards all the time. But with this design the uh, with the M5 stack that's the small square uh, display you saw was introduced by Ray, by the way. It was wonderful. He, he gave us this idea. Okay. And it's much easier to source the, um, the hardware. And also, we can do much more with it because it has a lot more memory. It has a lot more capability. Rob, uh, can you yeah. hear? Yeah, I can hear you. I just put up the uh, big ID cost data, which is the data that uh, that you're going to, can you just talk about what what is you know what you see here on the screen? Uh, hold on, I don't see your screen. Um, okay, well, you can see it. Your sharing screen, it says, so should be. Okay, so, so maybe I'll talk about it. Oh, I I you want me to show it, Peter? No, no, I'm already showing it, but I'm not sure why you okay. can't uh, see it. Uh, because I'm still on. Or so, so, so Rob, just, I'll, I'll just, I'm not sure why you can't see, but I just wanted to share, because we're talking about the big Aggie cast, and we posted the link in the um, YouTube channel. Uh, if you click on that, you will see exactly the same thing. And uh, what it shows is this is actually, you know, today we have been following, uh, you know, the, the Safecast team. You can actually see where they have been driving today, and you can see what the radiation levels have been. So we started at, you know, at, at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we, we stopped somewhere in the middle, but uh, you can see all the way through. And currently, they just have recently reached the uh, area around the Daiichi plant itself. And you can see the radi radiation levels are gone up about two and a half microsieverts an hour. And so this is what the big IG cost is doing. It basically real time uh, transmits out the data so that we can do things like you're seeing here. And Rob, uh, an uh, intern we had, and we have a lot of interns that actually are in, have interned with us over the last 10 years. One of our interns in Holland, uh, uh, Rob, help me with the name, uh, uh, has been working on this. So we just wanted to show this. And I think uh, Emo is now showing the actual big IG that has to be IG cost on it. So you get an idea of, of what that looks like. And so it keeps on transmitting and it allows, you know, basically allows us to follow what's happening in real time. But it also is a great way, uh, you know, to get a sense of, you know, how things change throughout the landscape that we've been driving through today. Mm -hmm. So just back to you, Emmy. Yep. So Peter, today it's rainy. So it, is it true that, that we have higher radiation when it's rainy in general? It's a very good question. Ask the question to <laughs> Okay. Uh, Asvi or Joel, can you guys hear us? Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, video is disabled for us. Can you enable our video? I, I can hear you. But our video is disabled, so maybe enable our video. Yeah, you can you can talk. We can hear you. Sure. Okay. So, yes, so today it's raining. So how how would you say the radiation level is compared to a sunny day? Um, 
you know, I, I don't, Joe, do you think it makes much, uh, much difference? Yes, what, it makes a little bit of difference. Um, the, it, today, the rain is coming from a fairly low altitude. So the, it's basically covering some of the ground. So the radiation is probably a little bit lower than it normally would be. Uh, if on days when the rain comes from either from thunderstorms and very high altitude, it contains even more radiation sometimes. So it could be a little bit higher. So, but the changes from the rain in a level that's as high as it is here are pretty minimal. I mean, in places like Tokyo, we can see an increase of 20, 25% on a, on, a, on a hot rainy day or a day where the, when the rain has got uh, material in it. But up here, it's the same amount added, but it's a small percentage of what's actually out on the ground up here. Yeah. And we'll just point out, we're in front of uh, Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah. And what's the radiation level here? Um, looks like it's about 2.5 microsieverts an about, hour here. Yeah, about, about, two, about five normally. About 2.5 microsieverts an hour here, very close by. It, it's, it's double that. We're on the yeah. side of the road right here. So, and we'll be be talking more about this in a little while. Okay. How far away are you now? From, from where? From Daiichi. Yeah. Uh, we're well. We're at the, the the guard post. So the the this is kind of the entrance. We're about. 1200 meters from the reactors. Yeah, okay. so like a few hundred meters from the entry gate of the yeah. of Fukushima Daiichi on the entry road. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk to you later soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Then we're gonna get out soon, shortly. Yeah, so uh, I think we're gonna go on to the next program. Thank you, Kelsey and Nando and Bob. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and over my student. Yes. Peter. Emmy, Emmy, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, Asmi, can you hear us? Uh, Mark? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have a uh, conversation here. Uh, let me see if everything is there. So, uh, I'm not sure, Kelsey, did, are we, do we have a video on this? I, I'm going to run through a PowerPoint and then show my video at the end. Okay, so so that's awesome. Uh, so first of all, Mark, welcome to uh, to the Safe Class 10th anniversary. It's absolutely fantastic to have you, uh, you know, uh, with us today, so so to speak, in the car and uh, on the virtual drive, which is a real drive in Fukushima, uh, and and share time with us. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, first of all, I would like to. Uh, talk a little bit about SafeCast here. You know, we have done a lot of projects over the last 10 years with a lot of people and organizations that felt really inspired by, by, by SafeCast. And a lot of things overlapped uh, in, in many ways. It's also important to notice that, as I have mentioned earlier a few times, is that SafeCast is a volunteer organization. And we're highly dependent uh, on, on collaborations and donations and grants as well. And so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about it today as well. Uh, with with, uh, with, with Mark, who is who is an expert in, in some of these uh, these programs, uh, but uh, it's it, what I wanted to highlight is is that if you feel inspired, uh, do look at the donation uh, the donation uh, button uh, on 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 the website, and and do uh, do something with it, uh, or buy one of these beautiful pillows or or, or hats. Um, so. Uh, so, so Mway, uh, we had a uh, very uh, exciting project that we have done together, and we're going to talk about that. And I would like, like to leave that to Mark to kind of describe what we have done together and and how we see you know how, how we see things you know all, along the way ten years ago and today. Mark, over to you. Peter, thank you very much. And for those who don't know me, who I think are most of you, uh, my name is Mark Davidson. And I am Director of Government and External Affairs uh, at a company in Shibuya called Amway Japan. And I'm really honored to be, to be part of the program today. In the SafeCast spirit of cooperation and partnership between the international community and Japan, um, I will also be speaking in Japanese, uh, if that's okay, uh, to ensure that everyone feels included uh, and part of the conversation. よろしくお願いします。はい、お願いします。皆さん、あの、こんにちは。あの、日本アンウェイの政府障害部のディレクターのマーク・デイビードさんと申します。本日はこのような機会にお招きいただき、大変あの光栄に思っております。これから Hi, share screen. Hi. Minisan, mieru do shoka. Ok, 
Can everyone see the, the um, PowerPoint? Loud and clear. I'm sorry, are, are you able to see that? Yes, very, very well. Great, okay, well, thank, yes. thank you. Um, I think you all know that SafeCast is truly a remarkable organization. It leverages the power of people, technology, and the free flow of information to make our world better. SafeCast and Amway Japan share a common vision. It's a vision of helping people live healthier, more empowered lives. And really that's what successful philanthropy is all about, finding a shared vision and diving deep as partners. We're honored to be a strong supporter and strategic partner of SafeCast. And if I may reiterate what Peter just said, I would encourage everyone who's watching today um, to dig deep and support this fabulous organization and its work. SafeCast no mine sama wa, ano honto ni ano subarashi katsuro o nasatte masu. Yori yoi sekai no jitsugen ni mukete, hito to technology o katsuyoshi, jiu na jouho o no nagare o teikyo shite ano kurusatte masu. Mata ano hito bito no yori kenkou teki de jiritsu shita seikatsu o shien suru toyu ano heisha no vision to shinwa sei mo takaku. セーフカストの皆様の活動をあの協力にあのあのに支援し、あの戦略的なパートナーシップと共にあの歩めるあのことをにあの光栄にあの感じます。At Amway Japan, our commitment is to help the people of Tohoku restore the kizuna or bonds of community that were severed by the terrible triple disaster of 10 years ago. We do this by constructing community centers, reflecting the unique desires and requests of each of our host communities. And then we fill those buildings with life. We partner with local organizations to bring people together through a wide variety of activities. Nihon Amoi dewa, ano, ano, higashi Nihon Daishin Sai no Sanju Sai Gai ni yori, tachi kirete shimatta Tohoku no community no kizuna. やあのつながりをあの取り戻す支援をすることにあの強いあの決意を持って取り組んでおります。私たちの活動はそれぞれのコミュニティ共有のニーズに従い、あの原子の希望を反映させてコミュニティセンターをあの建設あのすること、また単に建設するだけでなく、地方団体と手をあのたざ I'm gratified that our efforts in Remember Hope have won many national and international awards for our success and impact in rebuilding. These community ties, these kizuna. Taihen yurokobashi koto ni wa, tashitachi no kizuna o ano tori mudosu katsudo remember hope wa, kore made kokunai gai de ano kazu oku no show o jushou sesete itadakimashita. Fundamental to kizuna is a sense of trust, or the anshin or peace of mind that comes from knowing that the information you're getting about your community and environment is accurate. And trustworthy. For us, then, in our effort to restore Kizuna, SafeCast is a natural partner. Kizuna o ano tori mudosu ue de ano kiso to naru no ga jibu no community ya kankyo ni ano kanshite etteiru jouhou ga seikaku de shinrai dekiru mono de aru toyu atashikasa to anshin kan desu. Desu kara ano heisha ni totte SafeCast no mine sama to tomo ni. In 2018, we installed the SafeCast、uh, Environmental Radiation Sensor, PointCast, at our Amway Community House in Soma, Fukushima Prefecture. In 2018, we installed the SafeCast Community House in Soma, Fukushima Prefecture. In 2018, we installed the SafeCast Environmental r a d i a t We also worked with SafeCast to fill that same house with life. We put on a summer vacation workshop for local kids 
called Soma Future Lab 2018. In cooperation with JAXA, or the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Fukushima University, SafeCast representatives engaged kids and sparked in them a real passion for science and technology. Mata, shiki no kodomo tachi o atsumata ano natsu yasumi, jiu king kyu tokubetsu program, Soma Future Lab, Nisen Ju Hachi mo ano kaisai susete itiraki. JAXA ya Fukushima Daigaku no kankeisha to tomoni. Taiken o tsujite, kodomo tachi ga kagaku ya technology no eno kanshin o fukumerareru ano ba o the most important aspects of successful philanthropy and successful cooperation are perspective, passion, and partnership. We share all these elements with SafeCast. On recent projects, we've also partnered with another partner with whom we have mutual understanding, the iconic architect Kuma Kengo. Kuma Sensei has said, and I quote, how we rebuild Tohoku can show all of Japan a new way of living in the future. Taikin no project de wa heisha no vision ni fukaku sando shite kudesatteru nihon o daihyo suru kenshiku ka no kuma ano kengo sensei ga ano sekke o ano go tanto ano kudesat kudesaimashita. Ano kuma sensei wa kono fuko o toshite mirai no aterashi seikatsu yoshiki o nihonju ni ano shimesu koto ga dekiru to oshatte ano imas. I believe SafeCast Japan is showing Japan and the world this new way of living, a way based on science, on trust, and human connection. And at this moment in history, there is perhaps no more noble work than that. Masani safe cast no mina samawa. Nihon to sekai ni kagaku to shinrai. So shite hito to hito to no tsunagari o ano kiso to shita atarashi seikatsu yoshiki o teikyo shite kuresatte iru to kanjite orimasu. Ima, kono shunkan, kore ijo ni suko na ano katsudo wa nae no dewa nai de shouka. I now like to show uh, a short video. Uh, that shows Remember Hope's work and highlights our work together with our strategic partner, uh, SafeCast. And watch for a brief cameo uh, by the famous Peter Franken. Saigo ni ano heisha no Remember Hope ni ano kansuru sampun hodo no ano video o goran itadaki. SafeCast no mine sama to tomo ni kore made dono yona katsudo o susete itadaita no ka. Peter Franklin Shimo Ishunde Ano Tukubetsuna guest to Ano Shitsuen Ano Shite Ano Kurusati Masto de Dozo Ano Goraninate Kurusai. Hontini Minasa Kyoba Gosecho O Itiraite Domoni Hontini Domo Ariadamzaimas. Thank you very much for your attention. And if I could ask our partners in the studio uh, to take it away and show the video. Thank you. Yes, we're, we're going to do the video, right? So, so Mark, thank you so much for that. We're, we're about to run the video. Just give us a moment. Thank you. And uh, it should be there in a second. We'll see Osby walking around there and Daichi. We're going to talk to him in a moment uh, after the video. While we're waiting for the video, let me just say once again to everyone watching, you know, working with SafeCast feels good and does good. Uh, and, and I would hope everyone could, could share in that uh, and, and to the extent possible, uh, help support this fabulous organization. Thank you, Mark. You should write our PR copy. <laughs> you know where to find me.
Mark, we, we need a lot of volunteering and you're doing an amazing good go. job. So I would definitely suggest that uh, we talk later after this. Thank I you. think we're ready for the video now. So Kelsey, give it a roll.東日本大震災から10年。震災によって壊滅的な被害を受け、地域のコミュニティは失われました。私たちにできることは何なのか。地域コミュニティ再生のため、2012年、リメンバーホープ東北復興支援プロジェクトを開始。再生を忘れない希望を届ける。これまでに6棟のアムウェイハウスが建てられました。2022年 南三陸町に新たなアムウェイハウスが完成予定です。単にその自宅を復興するっていうのでは不十分で、やはりコミュニティを復興する、コミュニティをもう一回そこに再建するってことがすごく重要で、アムウェイハウスは建ててからが始ま